Morning, everybody. We're still admitting some colleagues into the meeting, just giving them some time to join in. We'll be with you in a few seconds. Uh, Harry, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Uh, I'm Vessel Lemmer from Aquas Grain, so it's good for me to meet you. Um, so Mariana retired and I had to follow up uh, in, a, in a shoes. Uh, Thank you so, for letting us know, Vessel. Yeah, do you um, did Mariana work well together or uh, collaborate frequently? Yes, Vessel, can we talk offline? We can do that. Thank you yep. very much. Thank you. Thank you. Well, there they go. Good morning to all the good colleagues. It's so great seeing everybody here. I see Brenda for a change joined in as well. Brenda, also so nice seeing you again. Um, uh, hopefully the weather is, is uh, well there in Modamoli. Um, we're still allowing a lot of people into the meeting. So that's why I'm doing a little bit chit chat. A lot of people are still joining in. But it's great seeing all the faces. Um, and uh, while we're waiting for people to join in, maybe a little bit housekeeping um, to make sure that everybody's is comfortable. So uh, those of you who do not know Zoom yet, not comfortable with the Zoom platform yet, um, you will see to the bottom of your screen, to the bottom left, there's a, there's a mute, uh, and the video mute uh, option. Um, we ask you to, to mute yourself during the event. Uh, part of my job also is to sit and mute people and make sure that they, they mute it. Otherwise we've got too much background noises. And um, then also you will see there's a chat room or chat box function where we greet each other and uh, where we ask questions. So you're welcome uh, to use, to make use of that chat room to post questions for the panelists uh, during the questions and answers session. We will then uh, look at a chat room. The people following on YouTube, you will also be able to post questions or text your questions in the, in the YouTube uh, interface. And we will use that also during the panel discussion. So um, then, um, Good idea to put your phone on silent. Um, it usually rings in a very uncomfortable time, especially in my case. And um, 
in case of emergency, should something happen, keep an eye on your email inbox. We will send you then an email, you know, to rejoin the session should something happen with this event. Um, and then also in the, and this is now during the panel discussion and questions and answers, you'll see in the participants box, you can click on participants and you can also um, rename yourself. Sometimes your device's name is there instead of your name. So you can mouse over your own name in the participants box and you can rename, you know, from your device name to your own name. You can even put your name and your company name so we can see where you're from. You're welcome to do that. And um, yeah, so there's a raise hands function. So should you want to ask a question during the, the you know, panel discussion, we can then see that you, you would like to ask a question. Um, after this event, we will share uh, the feedback uh, link so that you can kindly provide us some feedback uh, on this event. It's important to have your feedback and to keep these events uh, up to scratch. We really appreciate your, your comments, even, you know, maybe a suggestion for future topics and so on would be great. We really appreciate that. It helps a lot. Um, right. I just want to share my screen with you so that we can um, have a look at, at more of this, uh, the program and so on and give some recognition to our sponsors. So give me just a moment. I'll be with you in a second. All right, so program today, um, we're talking about economic recession uh, and are we approaching it correctly? It's today, the 17th of September, 2020. And uh, we've got an exciting list of panelists. Uh, we've got uh, Mark Schusler, the chief economist of Economist of COSA. Uh, and he's going to talk about how should we deal with the economic crisis from a country perspective. We've got Wayne Dubenake. Chief Executive Officer of Alta is going to talk about what and what, where and what is the origin of corruption and how should we fight this. And then we'll have a panel discussion uh, where you can ask questions to these panelists. We do not encourage questions during the presentations, so we do not have interruptions. We'll take a short break so you can grab a cup of coffee and then we'll have our host for the day, Lucille Majola, Chief Executive Officer of the Bunya Group. She's going to give us an overview on the mini taxi industry economic review. And then uh, we've got Andrew Barker, who's a development consultant of note, and he's going to talk about property and infrastructure suggested approach to help address the economic recession from the roots. And then we'll have a panel discussion again. And uh, yeah, really exciting. The presentations we see being presented here today will be uploaded to the Transport Forum's website. So we will give you guys um, access to that as complimentary. Um, so uh, that is the website that you can use to um, download the presentations. It's actually presentations of all the presentations over the past uh, 13 and a half years uh, of the Transfer Forum's existence. So it's one of the strongest knowledge bases, uh, definitely uh, nationally, and we're getting, getting actually international recognition for this, uh, the power of this knowledge base. If you go and search any um, date or person that's presented at the Transfer Forum over the past 13 and a half years. So on the website, you'll have to log in, your username and password. Should you not have an account yet, then you'll go to sign up and you will use the sign up to create your own complimentary account. It will send you a confirmation email and so on. And then you'll obviously have your own username and password. Should you struggle, you're welcome to send me an email. You all have my email address because I'm spamming you every week. Thank you for having me in your inbox. And uh, so once you've logged in, then you can select events and you can go to downloads. And then when in downloads, you will get a, a, a simple little search engine. And this search engine, you can type in a title or a description or a person's name. And if you click search, it will give you all the presentation presented by that person over the past 13 years. Or you can go to category and you can use the category option to select today's date, for example, or a certain event's date. And it will bring up all the presentation presented at that date. So it's as simple as that and, and very effective, very powerful. Um, 
Note the business directory, it's only 450 rands per annum. Um, we've outsourced the business directory to Olga Mashilu from Berlin Bonfair Consultants. And uh, she, you can take a picture of the screen, maybe a number there, and she can help you to get your company listed uh, for the business directory. And, and there's quite a number of each people are getting from this uh, business directory, very popular. So uh, Olga and the team can help you to get listed and all the revenue uh, through this goes for a company. It's a BE initiative as well from the transport forum. So that is a, a little bit more housekeeping. If we get back to our um, program, I just like to give a quick recognition to our sponsors. You know that everything is complimentary, so somebody must pay the bill and that's our valued sponsors. Um, uh, I will give opportunity just now to our host, uh, Bunye and Vusili Majola to give us an introduction to her company. But before I do that, quickly, the other sponsors, um, we've got University of Johannesburg, and it's the Department of Logistics Studies, the Institute for Transport and Logistics Studies, um, that has uh, been promoted, and it's done through the Institute, uh, through the Department of Transport and Supply Chain Management of the University of Johannesburg. And uh, you know, it's all about the need for independent, unbiased, relevant, and up-to-date research um, at University of Johannesburg. And they've got great online uh, courses that you also can subscribe to. You can go to the Transport Forum website to get more information about that. Um, we've got Paxi. Paxi is part of the PEPCOR group. It's a parcel service that allows consumers, agents, suppliers, and institutions to send, collect, and return parcels to over 2,000 Paxi collection points. For your convenience, there's a Paxi point in every PEP. Great uh, opportunity and very convenient to send your parcels across the country and, and very, very reasonable pricing. You've got Kalula.com. Kalula is a, a proud sponsor of the Transport Forum, and hopefully we will see them soon back in the air. We're very proud and having the Kalula and the Com Air brand associated with the Transport Forum. We've got Global Trade Solution. Um, I don't know if there's somebody from Global Trade Solution online yet to tell us more about Global Trade Solution. You're welcome to unmute yourself and tell us more about GTS. Okay, maybe I can tell you a little bit more about them. They're user-friendly, cloud-based, international trade and supply chain solution that incorporates the core requirements to manage all activities around international supply chain in a compliant and cost-effective manner. GTS offers seamless integration with the various entities in the international supply chain, including the statutory agencies such as the customs authorities. So find the information on our web, you will find it very useful should you be an exporter and importer as well. Um, Right, Zutari, is there anybody from Zutari on, on board to say a few words about Zutari? You can unmute yourself. <clears throat> morning, Harry, it's Yolanda Furi here from Zutari. Um, Good morning. Right. Um, yeah, so we are really now launched our new brand. Um, so proudly Zutari, proudly Africa. Um, we still do the same work, consulting, engineering, you know, from, from uh, I would say, transport and um, water, energy, mining, um, and of course, advisory services as well in South Africa and in the whole of Africa. So um, happy to be a sponsor of this forum. Thank you very much, uh, Yulani. We, we're proud of having this talk a brand associated with the Transport Forum. You guys have been the sponsor of this Transport Forum for more than four years already. So it's really great having you guys on board. Uh, and thank you for your gold sponsorship. We've got Freight News uh, for, uh, by FTW. Is there somebody from Freight News who want to say a few words, perhaps? Let me tell you more. I know they're coming on board a bit later. Um, it says, that, well, Freight News is a next generation niche site combining the in depth expertise of freight and trading weekly and the daily immediacy of FTW online. 
which are household names in the transport community. So uh, um, ladies and gents, it's all about freight and logistics news and uh, regular freight and logistics news. And they've got special features as well, you know, focusing or focused at, at different, um, well, corridors and supply chains and regions and so on. And if you're not subscribed to them, you, you're losing out seriously. So I would really um, encourage you to subscribe to FTW. Um, right, we've got C-Track. Um, C-Track, anybody from C-Track want to say a few words? Let me tell you more. Uh, C-Track, they say we assist our clients to transform their business with in innovative software as a solution, internet of things, and mobile solutions. We're passionate about changing the way business communicate, collaborate, and operate around the world, allowing you to take action on the insights from our cutting edge devices and cloud platforms. Our support and hardware solutions come together in clever, user-friendly and powerful software systems, enabling your business to always be visible. And that's what it's all about, to always be visible, um, which is so important today. Um, so talk to C-Track to have everything in your business be visible. And uh, it's, imp it's imp impressive to see the control center and the command center, how they actually control and track all your vehicles and assets. It's, it's really, Great to having them as part of your business. All right, we've got Railways Africa magazine. It's Philippa and her team. It's an African continent specialist trade technical business to business publication, an online news service covering all aspects of the rail sector. With the current investment and future and potential investment being made in rail and road infrastructure projects, Railways Africa brings both global and local consultants, manufacturers, suppliers, and OEMs to the fore. Published weekly online and in print, six times a year, Railways Africa is the authoritative publication for the road industry in Africa. So subscribe to them for all your needs on the news on, on, on railways and rail infrastructure. Um, all right, let's move to Cuba Pay. Cuba, I'm sure there's something for somebody from Cuba Pay would like to say a few words. You can unmute yourself, tell us a little bit more about Cuba Pay. Hi, hi, Eric. It's Ren Kaunda from Cuba Pay. Hi, uh, Ren. Good morning, colleagues. Um, firstly, on behalf of Cuba, I have to thank Harry for all the fantastic work he's done with Transport Forum. Um, I think this is one forum where everybody comes together, shares ideas, and of, of course, we learn a lot from it. With over 30 years of experience, Cuba specializes in transport ticketing solutions. We've implemented successful projects, both locally as well as across the globe. And we look forward to using our knowledge and products to, to assist the public transport. Like we all aware, under these tough economic conditions, effective maximizing and monitoring of revenue, revenue collection is key. And should anybody require any further information on revenue collection systems for the transport sector, please feel free to give us a call or we can chat offline. Thank you. Thank you, Shireen. Appreciate your gold sponsorship. Already three years gold sponsor. We really appreciate your support. Ladies and gents, then uh, Optibus, uh, it's an international organization, help you scheduling your public transport operations. Um, organization of note, uh, the 1st of October event, they're also going to say a few words again. Um, so yes, take a look at their portfolio. It really be, will be worth your while. What I want to do now is I would like to give our host for the day, Luisele Majola, Chief Executive Officer of the Ubunye Group, to give us opportunity to tell us more about Ubunye and to do the official welcome this morning. Thank you, Ubunye, uh, Ubunye Group and Luisele for supporting the Transport Forum. Good morning, everyone. Um, thanks again for, for, for joining us for this um, session. Um, we have been extremely lucky um, with regards to um, the attendance as well as just the feedback that we have received from um, 
some of the of the forums that we have collaborated on over the the past couple of of, of months thank you very much um again for 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 your support um i also just want to um acknowledge our our speakers today and um thank you again for for accepting um our invitation and um being part of this very very critical um, conversation that um, as a country we we need to have and we need to 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 start having um, solutions towards um, how do we bring um, South Africa to to prosperity um, and speaking from a transport uh, perspective we all understand the critical role that um, transport plays in, in um, enabling um, economic growth. So I'm really, really grateful today um, to, to Mike Schussler for accepting the invitation as well as um, Wayne um, and uh, Mr. Andrew um, Barker for, for, for being part of, of this critical conversation. Um, just a brief, um, Overview of Ubunye. Um, our role is to basically create that platform for engagement where we share insights, where we, 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 we share um, conversations that seemed that seek to um, push the economic needle, but also um, work towards um, integrating and enabling an efficient transport um, system in, in, in South Africa. Now, going back to um, our discussion today, um, um, so in 2019, um, the World Economic um, Forum ranked um, South Africa 60th um, in, their, in their global competitive index and um, with health, um, skills and ICT adoption uh, being among the lowest ranking um, in, 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 in the index and um, all of these things have material impact on the country's uh, productivity. Um, now, um, economic growth has been weak um, over the past decade, um, averaging at only 1.7% between 2010 and uh, um, 2019. Um, and in 2019, we saw um, a stall of a, uh, that saw a decrease to about 0.2%. Um, now, this is far, far, far from um, the 5% target rate that um, required by our, our very beautiful um, national development um, plan. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping that today coming out of the discussions, we, we are going to um, highlight some of the critical um, factors that are influencing this stalled growth or um, even come up with, with um, suggestions of, of how do we uh, move towards uh, prosperity through, for instance, increasing the country's savings and investments. Um, issues of, of, of demography um, in our country. And we see this um, specifically in the, in the transport sector. Um, policy and institutions, um, I'm really looking forward to what Wayne is going to share with us with regards to the disconnect between policy and institutions and how crippling corruption has, has been to, to the effectiveness of, of our institutions. Our education system is ailing, our health system is, is ailing. And um, obviously then uh, we look at the openness of, of our economy and how all of these factors um, can come in together to, to assist us to um, move towards um, um, a, a um, a, a, a growing um, and not just growing, but also a sustainable economy. I'm really looking forward um, to today's discussions. Um, after the after the after the um, uh, the break, um, I will then give a, a an industry uh, a minibus taxi industry economic um, review, and um, this is 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 very seldom done because. Um, they, there is not a lot of understanding of the taxi industry. However, we do concede that it, it um, contributes quite significantly 
um, to the to the um, to the economy of this country, the material um, thereof obviously is still um, uh, open to 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 research, so that we can see the actual um, numbers. But I'm looking forward to today's conversation. Welcome everybody. Uh, we're looking forward to your comments as well as um, the panel discussions. Thank you very much, Harry. Thank you so much, Vujit, for your report and your official welcome and intro. We're looking forward in hosting this day, this day with you. And surely we've got exciting panelists that's going to share their knowledge and expertise with us. So um, I think uh, appropriate now to say, is without further ado, uh, I would like to introduce you to our first presenter then, Mr. Mike Schussler. He's the chief economist of economist.coza. And he's going to talk to us about how should we deal with the economic crisis from a country perspective. Thank you so much, Mike. Thank you, Harry. I'm just gonna try and share the screen quickly. Uh, let's see if I'm gonna be able to do that. Uh, okay. I hope you can all see. Uh, on you your can screen. see it. That's fine, uh, Mike. Thank I'm going to quickly talk about the world economy forecasts um, from international institutions and how it's looking at the moment. A bit of a focus on transport. We're also going to look at the South African economy. Uh, look at the transport sector, a few signs of a turnaround, but our government is in serious trouble. Um, and then we're going to just a word on a lot uh, on unemployment and where we're going to maybe in the longer term. Um, just need to get this to move. Um, I don't know why that's not okay. So if we look at the poll of forecasters that the um, uh, Economist magazine keeps um, updating uh, every week, you can see that South Africa is expected to have about an 8% decline. Uh, locally, uh, our own economists think it's going to be about an 8.4, 8.5%, depending which survey, the Reuters or the uh, Bild one you're following. Um, but Overall, we're going to be one of the bigger declines in the world. Um, uh, there are only two countries that are going to see positive growth this year. Ironically, China is going to see positive growth. They came in with a reasonable amount of momentum, uh, but one has to take that with a bit of a pinch of salt. And Egypt, all the rest are in serious uh, decline. Peru and uh, has had a very, very long lockdown. Uh, they started on the 16th of March. They've got the highest of all the countries over a million death toll uh, now. They locked down early. Uh, Spain, Argentina, France all had very hard lockdowns. So did India, South Africa, Malaysia, Chile. Japan had no lockdown, but it's an aging population. So they have a, a bit of a different issue. If we look at the first quarter uh, data, I didn't put in China because it was quite negative here. But you can see that overall, there were still a few countries growing, but those that had locked down early-ish uh, were seeing uh, declines in GDP already. The second quarter is the main quarter where the world got caught out quite heavily. Um, and the red ones here are very simply those countries that locked down are harder and longer. And the yellow is softer lockdowns, green is no lockdowns other than international borders and big events. They were everybody put in place certain things. Uh, Thailand got hit hard because the tourism industry is about 20% of their GDP. Um, and the orange numbers here are big countries like the United States and China, where there were different sort of lockdowns. For those of you that may not be aware, China did not lock down half their economy. Uh, they never closed Beijing, for example. They closed the market in Beijing, but they never closed uh, uh, many places. And they stopped the virus from spreading in one area, but allowed international flights into that area. So the virus didn't hit the rest of China so hard, but hit the rest of the world very hard. 
Um, it was quite a strange situation that we don't even talk about that. You can see Taiwan didn't lock down uh, much. They were local lockdowns in South Korea. But these countries didn't have uh, 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 big declines in GDP. Um, if we then go into the other areas here, you can see huge declines. Uh, we haven't got Peru's figures yet. Um, I suspect that they'll be worse. But you can see South Africa is one of the bigger declines. Um, but all around the world, we're seeing a very big uh, problematic uh, situation. I think I was sorry, this slide disappeared. Just very quickly, if you look at the average, the world is going to decline with about 5%. These are the world institutions that look next year, the comeback is about 4.1%. But if you look at the graph next door, you can see if 2019 is 100, you can see how the world falls and the per capita GDP takes us four years to get back. Um, and it takes two years for the world's GDP to come back to above 2019 levels. So this is not a, a, a small thing. And some of these forecasts are quite positive. I, I think the IMF and the Oxford Economics, I don't see over 5% next year world growth. Uh, I can go along with a 4%, but the point is it's going to take a while. If we then uh, go and we analyze countries, we know that some of them were on a growth cycle that was already weak, South Africa, Norway, Thailand, uh, Chile, Uruguay. Uh, others locked down early, the Philippines and so on, had a very uh, uh, tough lockdown too. And it is just really a worldwide uh, it's it's such a big mess. It's the biggest um, decline in our generation worldwide. It's the biggest decline in South Africa in our generation. And it is um, by far the worst economic downturn that we would have seen. If we look quickly at the containers, well, they're starting to turn the corner, but they're still negative on a year ago. Um, we can look at air freight. Air freight's going to be hit very, very hard um, and has been hit hard. But you can see even in China, air freight is still negative. In South Africa, it's also negative. Uh, but around the world, there's very few places, uh, Taiwan being the exception at the moment, where uh, air freight is in positive territory. You can see car sales around the world. This is about 95% of the world's car sales down 31%, 32% on a year ago. And that was already down eight, nine percent. So right now we're seeing a decimation of some industries um, on a scale that we haven't seen before. Uh, I think we must get ready for some big brands not being with us soon. And when consumers get worried, as they are around the world, they don't always buy uh, the big ticket items. And this time around, I think it'll be especially cars because people are saying, all right, I keep my car a little longer. I don't drive that much anymore. Uh, and there's electric cars coming. So there's other factors at play in each industry, but that's just putting it uh, uh, there. So you can see it's a big number. Um, the workplace closures, you can see quite stringent in Latin America, uh, US, South Africa, uh, parts of Europe over the while. Um, but far less so in places like Taiwan, Japan, and they've had very, very little spread of the virus there as well. Sweden uh, had a, a bit of a bad spell with uh, some, but they didn't lock down their offices that much. And you can see even Norway, where people compare Sweden to, didn't lock down as much. Um, and so on. that's from Oxford. The, you can see the here the... Um, uh, second quarter manufacturing around the world, South Africa in third uh, last place. Um, these are big declines. These are not small um, declines whatsoever. And you can see the whole world, uh, you look at the world, X, the US, there's a very big decline um, there. Um, it, it's um, just getting, it's about 15%. So really the world took out a uh, hammering uh, the PMIs are starting to indicate that we are bouncing back. There's many of them over 50. My problem with this is how much is the bounce back over 50? 
So when you're looking to the past, which is very bad, it's a low number, and you now got a better number, you're still from a low base, um, but at least we are turning uh, around and many countries are looking a lot positive than I would have believed, like Brazil, even the United States, um, but South Africa too. So that's a very positive sign. Um, the fact that we haven't had inflation uh, is a bit strange with all the money floating around, but when people aren't driving, when people aren't using oil, the major commodity in the world is still very, very low. It's dropped again. Whereas the economic commodity, Dr. Copper, has lifted up a lot more. It's a V-shaped recovery there. Um, it's slowing down that recovery, maybe. But I think the fact of the uh, copper is also partly uh, showing us that there is a hint of inflation starting to come through. Um, just to put it into uh, terms that we won't understand properly here, uh, the extra money being pumped this year is going to be in excess of $21 trillion. So if you say to me that the South African economy is roughly $350 billion, then you can understand that this is a huge, um, let's make it... Um, uh, uh, 60 times the, the, the value of the South African economy is being pumped into the, the world economy. And uh, that is a very um, large amount of money. On the transport side, very quickly, I think we need to look at this. You can see it's hit everybody. Um, China's rail is back. Um, Mexico rail is still up a bit. Uh, you can see the Port data is not that bad. The container data, there's some that are up. South Africa, US port containers, United Kingdom, all are down. Uh, the world is down. But in the Zeus Canal at the moment, there's still a lot more coming through. The coal ports, for example, coal is still being transported. That's from Newcastle in uh, Australia. You look at the air freight, it is a nightmare. The whole air freight industry is serious trouble. Um, the other thing with air freight is that it is a mixture of many flights or passengers and air. So when there's no passenger flights, there's also no air freight either. Road transport, the countries that I follow and I can get quite quickly data from, you can see here, they're all uh, negative overall. And that's on the freight transport. That's not transport of uh, trucks and so on. Our own economy, um, these are the latest uh, per capita numbers. It's taken us back to early 2000s. Uh, that's how big the fall in GDP was. Um, it, we will bounce back, but it will take a while to recover. In GDP per capita terms, to get back to 2019 levels, will take nine or 10 years. To get back to um, 2014 levels, which was our high point, I'll show you now, will take us 14, 15 years. Um, when people are poorer, they buy less things like cars, houses, furniture, um, although the furniture is held up quite a lot. I suspect it's more to do with uh, TVs and the like because people are now moving into Netflix. Um, if we look at this, I know it's got lots of colors, but the two purple lines, the one first purple line is 2014, which was our highest GDP per capita. That's all part of our history. We were in a slow decline. This year, based on the consensus forecasts from uh, BILT, uh, you can see that there's a big, big decline. Doesn't matter which one you use in the GDP per capita because our uh, population is still growing at roughly one and a half percent a year. It means that if you grow at two and a half percent a year, you only catch up with one percent sort of thing. So in the beginning, the catch up is quite a lot quicker, but then using that, IMF uh, potential sort of figures for South Africa of 2.2%, 2.4%, which we need to address. Uh, it's going to take us a long time. And this one, it's uh, 2035 that we get back to. So it's going to take us 20 years to get back to our previous high point. Uh, this has happened before um, from 1982 uh, uh, or 81, I think it was, we had a high point and we only reached that in the late 90s again. So we've had these episodes before, and we can even go back to the Great Depression. That took us sort of 14 years. 
uh, this one might be a little bit longer. Uh, if I take a look at where things are happening on the retail side, just generally speaking, you can see motor cars have had a very big decline. I mean, at, at some stage, our motor car industry on a three month basis was decimated because in April there were no sales. Um, and then you take the last three uh, months on three years ago. Strangely enough, I wouldn't have thought that furniture and appliances would be the one outgrowing. Pharmacies, I can understand. People have a fear and they're going to buy a pharmaceutical. Hardware will be like America. I can understand that too, because people are now spending more time at home. They're fixing their houses. They're getting their home offices going. And that's one big trend we're seeing around the world. Um, I suspect our furniture has to do with Netflix and Amazon and getting those sort of smart TVs to yourself so that you can watch it a bit more. Um, I think that's what basically may be happening there. But if you look at things like restaurants, um, it's 90% down up to, uh, these are July num uh, June numbers, the July numbers come out today. Um, but you look at the takeaways, you look at fuel sales, all these guys are heavily down. Um, and I think it's going to take a while to come back um, for us in overall. The consumer sales I'll get to now, the latest retail sales for July are showing just that the V-shape is a bit over. It's becoming the swoosh recovery. It's going to have a long tail. The closer we get to the top, the more it's going to be a problem um, to get up there. Uh, because we're going to lose a lot of employment, um, I'll talk about that a bit later. And we're going to see um, something happening there, I think. Uh, the, 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 the fact of the matter is, I think it's going to, it, it's going to take a, a lot longer uh, to get back up. But the first part of the bounce is there, and that's very positive, at least. Uh, if this is not June, just it's also July, July retail trade seasonally adjusted because the April numbers were so bad that jump up mining jumps up but look here electricity generated it's still down nine percent on the previous quarter um, yes it's annualized and so on but it says to you certain sectors even with the big meltdown in April now shifting to another quarter it is not quite there and again air freight and sea freight just to uh, for comparisons. Air freight is, is, is in a, a troubled child now. Uh, we can see from the transactions from the Betty index, which I do, um, we've had a very good recovery on a year ago basis, though. We're still down 4.4%. I think this uh, September month will be up a bit again. And I suspect that October could even be positive because October was, last year was a low base. The problem's going to come in in November and December when we again had higher base effects uh, then, we are not gonna have the same Christmas, we are told by many retailers uh, that we had last year. So I think it's going to be quite a struggle. And then we know that the UIF TERS program stopped spending. We know that the SASA grant extra payments of about nine to 10 billion rand a month disappear. So I think the fourth quarter is gonna show us the real pain for us in the transport sector, you can see how heavily hit we were. Um, our data goes back all the way to 2008. There has never been a time period when we've seen this this bad. This is the coincident indicator from the Reserve Bank as well. And you can see they follow us uh, quite a bit. Um, so we've got a very good idea what's going on. If we look at the GDP numbers, it's very difficult to distinguish, but we did provide indications that GDP could decline quite a bit. We were down 17.3% on a year ago, uh, I mean, on a quarter ago, uh, whereas the um, GDP was down 16.4%. So in the same ballpark, and these are big numbers. And if you look at the whole transport sector up to uh, July, again, this takes out the April uh, anomaly which didn't impact pipelines that much, strangely. I'll tell you more about that if you want. Um, but you can see right across the board, very big declines in our transport sector for the three months to July compared to a year ago. Um, bus and train passengers, uh, taxis uh, have not been uh, as busy. Um, Uber, drivers haven't been busy. Buses, about a third of capacity. Um, 
Prasa, I don't think will survive. I think it's uh, over Cordova's also for the Gau train. Um, they are just virtually in, in, July, in June, we had 140,000 rail passenger journeys where we normally have in the millions, we normally are at three or four, I mean, 30 or 35 million or whatever. So when you've got only 140,000 um, and you assume it's people going to and from work and that is 35 times, say, a month, <laughs> then it was literally like 20,000 people, if that. Uh, business confidence, very, very low. Um, we need to address things here because uh, the political constraint is the big issue. And business doesn't say it loudly enough, but it is an issue. And we need to get government to reform. And a thing, for example, just lifting the visa requirements would help our industry uh, a lot. Uh, if you just say anybody without a criminal, uh, who isn't being sought for criminal things can come to South Africa for three months, we automatically give you the visa we do the visa applications together with Botswana, Namibia, Swazi, Eswatini, and, and Lesotho. Um, we allow people to visit those countries and all the flights become internal, uh, like they do in many other areas in the world. That would make a, a big confidence boost, for example, in those uh, uh, that industry. And it would not cost us anything. It's a bit of political capital, not even much. Um, the South African government is just spending. It's spending like there's no tomorrow. These are the plans they had. But the second graph is maybe a very big uh, eye opener. You can see everybody in the world did spend a bit more in the emerging market world. Uh, the big emerging markets, the uh, overall emerging markets, which is here, I think a universe of about 25, 27. Um, and then you see uh, South Africa, where we were lower spending than most emerging markets, and we're now outspending them by quite some margin. And uh, that says to you that in 2004, we were spending 25, 26% of GDP. Now we're at 35% of GDP. Um, we didn't get anything extra for it. And that's part of the problem. The moment... Um, these figures would exclude this that you've just seen, but um, the last three months, the average that government spends more than it gets in is 61.3 billion. It's going to go a bit higher to over 70 billion, but that's per month. These are huge, huge deficits coming. Uh, we now estimate a deficit of around 800 or more billion. So 16% instead of 14.6% um, Darvi wrote, my friend is now estimating 17%. The tax revenue is not coming. Uh, the spending is taking place and it is going to be a very hurtful process. Um, that's going to lift this debt a lot because if you look at that, we're going to go over 100%. 16% um, now is what the, the uh, consensus economists say. Uh, forecasts are uh, for 11 and 9 percent to the following two years, whilst government is still talking of 9 percent and 8 uh, percent. So people are seeing that government says they'll go and try and get an active scenario. We all agree that by the end of this uh, financial year will be over 80 percent. We think it's going to be about 84 percent already. But even government, if they don't do anything, say we will be over 100 percent. And it's very difficult to see how they're going to change the spending in such a short time period. Um, and that is going to put us very much on the top of the emerging market debt uh, pile as a percentage of GDP. Maybe not alone, we'll probably be with Brazil and so on, but we'll start having problems with this. We went into, I'm going to slow down two seconds, but we went into um, this whole process um, with a high unemployment rate. Of all the big economies in the world, we had double the unemployment rate. I call it the depression unemployment rate. Um, America, during the Great Depression, their unemployment topped 
uh, uh, peaked at 25%. If you peak at 25% and you call it a depression and everybody uh, uh, says, yes, that is one of the indicators of a depression, then at 30%, we must be in a depression vis-a-vis -vis unemployment rates. And the broader unemployment rate is 39%. We know this is going up. So if we look at the other countries, what's happened, and we can see from our traffic as well, and from many other aspects, uh, for, the, uh, for example, we know the UIF is paying about 3 million people a month. Uh, not all of them will be permanently lost. That's not the point. Uh, but let's say one third, you add a million uh, uh, jobs to that. Then you add uh, the informal jobs gone. You add uh, other factors and you end up with a very big number. But if you look at the in increase in unemployment between the, uh, the end of 2019 and to the middle of 2020, and our figures aren't out, you can see the harder lockdown countries have all gone over 10%, or not all, but many have gone over 10% increase, Peru, Colombia, Philippines. Those also harder lockdown countries are Chile and India. Uh, you can see it's all gone up. So we expect ours to go up quite a bit. And um, at the moment, um, we, we, we think that we're going to go to about 40% unemployment. Um, that's in the first quarter of next year, because some unemployment takes a while. And we've got about 600,000 people net entering the job market. There's not going to be jobs for them. And that's where we see the peaking of the unemployment rate, either first or second quarter next year. So my low estimate is 36%. Um, that's very much where uh, the, the the lower end of the countries uh, with lockdowns ended up. The expanded unemployment, we estimate that it could go to 50%. Uh, we'll become the first country in the world that's not at war with a 50% unemployment rate. It's, it's a tragedy. It's a social uh, injustice. It provides for uh, many upheavals, uh, higher crime rates probably. So it's a very depressing situation, this, and that's why I call it depression employment uh, numbers or depression unemployment numbers, sorry. Uh, what our recovery will look like? Well, let's go and have a look. Um, at the moment, it seems that the, let's call it the broader Western countries are not quite back to normal with their transport. They're all roughly at uh, 60 to 80, or Paris is about 90 percent in the main. Uh, American cities are still far behind. They seem to uh, still be in the uh, throes of the virus and the panic of the virus. Um, if we look at China, it's giving us a, a, a few lessons here in the short term. You can see the, the, the domestic flights have taken off again. They're down 30 percent. They're not down 80, 90 percent anymore on a year ago basis. But the international flights, the freight flights, the passenger flights, you can see is down still nearly 100%. So it's going to take some parts like the international passenger. Uh, we shouldn't expect many tourists from the international side that are flying in. Yes, the guy will drive in from Namibia or Botswana, but they're not coming to fly in. You can see here with the um, figures, it hasn't really gone anywhere from China. Uh, it's taken, for example, their movies quite a while to get back up to uh, 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 sort of over 50% level. I think right now they don't have many movies, so it's come back down again. Coal consumption uh, went up. Um, by May, they were back to normal electricity in their six major power plants. Um, so these are big, big power plants, um, and they overdid it a bit, I guess, but Ultimately, for China, this is a bit of a flat indication. It's very much close to zero. If we look at out-of-home activities in Europe, North America, South Asia, they've all gone back to where they were and so on. That doesn't mean necessarily work. It could be you're uh, at a transit station at a, for an international uh, or a local flight or in Europe, an international flight in Europe grocery shopping, pharmacies, people are walking around uh, because I think they wanted to get out a bit. Um, but South America and South Africa and Southern Africa as such are still below the norm. And that's a worry because we've been 
far lower than the, the average of Europe and North America, even China and so on. We don't have the same Google mobility from China, but we've got other indicators. And uh, it is a bit of a worry that we're not back out and about. These numbers are up till about the 10th or so of uh, September. It might be the 9th, might be the 11th. And they're very quick to come out. So it gives us an idea that we're still not back to where we should be. We're having a lazy drift up, I think. Um, and then my big issue is money can't save this. Um, we need to really stop thinking that we can fix everything with money. And I'll give you a very simple example. If you have a doctor, you pay the doctor a million rand or a billion rand a month or 10 rand a month. It's still the same doctor. So you have to say to yourself, I have to get more doctors. I have to do things to improve the output of my universities to give me the doctors or whatever it is. So money alone, and definitely at the moment, the way we're spending, it's not going to fix us. We're going to end up in a huge debt. And here's why I say that. If you go and look at the private sector economy, whilst everybody was talking about the total economy, they didn't realize that finance and the government did not decline quite as much. And even including agriculture and the private sector, which increased because they're in a different cycle to the rest of us, there is a 25% decrease in the value that the private sector produced in one quarter. To, uh, or I mean, on a year ago basis, to get back this back, you have to grow 33%. 33%, you have to grow the private sector to get it back at the same levels uh, that it was a year ago. The private sector declined to levels that we last saw in 2004, in the second quarter of 2004. If government needs money, it gets it from the private sector. Money doesn't grow on trees. It taxes the private sector. Even if it borrows money for now, at some stage, it has to get it back from the sector adding the value. And the finance sector here borrows to that. And the equities, they buy that sector. They buy the profits of that. So they're dependent on this, call it the productive, the real economy, whatever. It includes things like transport, retail trade, manufacturing, mining, agriculture, uh, construction, and so on. If you've had a 25% decline, you need a 33% increase. Now, just to put it into terminology that we can all get with, we've had this sector only increase with about 15% over the last decade. The last time we increased with 33% was the decade to 1974. So, it's unlikely we'll get a good bounce, but it's unlikely that we'll get the full 33% back within a decade. I really think it'll be asking a lot unless we reform. We are there now. We need to get this going. So that's my big issue. Money can't fix us. We need to fix the private sector and the private sector needs to be given free reign as far as possible. I'm not saying no competition commission or uh, no investigations on labor matters. I'm just saying we need to understand that the private sector needs to be freed up. Very quickly, COVID impact, you can see um, they do surveys all the time and then the Bank of England did it. Um, five months after COVID started, 34% uh, of all English office workers are working from home. Uh, or workers, all workers. And in America, it's gone from 32% of office workers at least working sometimes at home to 48%. So definitely homework is going to do it, but it's not going to be permanent. Um, the lumber prices in America went to record highs because of work from home. Uh, in America, homes are built with uh, wood, for those of you that don't know that. And therefore, the guys stayed at home, fixed their houses and thought, well, I'm working from home now. I'm going to build myself a home office. And that's the sort of thing that we're seeing. And anecdotally, I see it in my street. Um, so we get maybe not all work, but much work gets done from home. Does this mean we start the internationalization of homework? Yes, I think so. I think there are opportunities uh, outside. There's many more forms of outsourcing, architects, accountants, journalists everything we can look at. This is a serious option for South Africans who are skilled in one form or another. 
Online sales in Britain has the best figures here. Total retail sales actually declined in Britain, but the online sales at the same time were up nearly 60%. So just think about it. The Uber driver is going to become a courier driver. The shop tool person is going to become the dispatcher in the warehouse. It's The warehouses are going to be the hot properties, perhaps. Um, I think higher education is going to go online and in that sense, you know, UNISA is probably way ahead of everybody else, but it's going to be an interesting factor for all of us. So I think for us as transport, uh, the courier company, the scooter and the buckies, I spoke to people now and I can see it in the numbers, the bucky figures did not decline as much as the passenger cars or the big trucks and the big trucks didn't decline as much as the passenger. So the trucks are going, the buckies are growing. Um, I really think that there's a big difference coming. I think the other thing is we must re rethink retail. Retail is going to be maybe just another warehouse center. So some people will go and try on the clothes in the retail space and then they'll buy some there. But the next time they want, they'll get onto the net or the phone or whatever and they'll order it. Um, and then it'll come from that same shop. We're seeing that with checkers, for example, 6060, they're using the same shop uh, for that distribution of retail. So it, the distribution angle changes. Is a city center dead? Two or three of my friends have told me Santon is a ghost town. If you go to Waterfall Estate or Santon right now and other areas, I don't know them all, but where the office workers used to be, they're gone. I mean, I think some accounting firms put up very pretty buildings. Uh, I think they're sweating right now because nobody wants to work in these buildings permanently anymore. You'll probably get to a place where you're working two or three days a week in these buildings, but that means you need far less building. And human interaction might be, is still vital, and it might be one of the things that makes transport change uh, in that sense. So our freeing up of services internationally, I think, is a brilliant, brilliant thing that's happening. And I'm finished, basically, but I'm going to say we were down in the dumps. It's going to take us a lot longer to get out of this dump, but we've done a big bounce back. And that's the positive. The big bounce back has happened, basically. So many things will work smoothly. I think we should go to level zero as quickly as possible. I think the economy is really, really going to struggle. And I think that uh, part However, the worst is over. That put the positives first. The worst is definitely over and we're going to go forward from here. But the damage done to the world economy, to some emerging market economies and South African economy has been very, very big. And it's going to take a while to get out of this. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mike. Uh, statistically well supported presentation as usual and uh, sharing knowledge. I was actually hoping that you, you know, had some kind of a magic potion so that we can leapfrog this 20 years to have our bounce back to the high point sooner. Uh, it uh, would be interesting to actually see, you know, um, uh, my way to Vilana, who's the, who's the new um, uh, head of strategy for Praza uh, on the 1st of October at our event, is going to tell us more about Praza's uh, turnaround plan. So it will also be interesting to see that. Um, yeah, so I'm quite sure the audience is looking forward to engaging with you in the panel discussions just now. Um, and please stay online. Thank you very much, Mike, for this excellent presentation. We really appreciate this. Let me share my screen quickly. Um, our next presenter will then be Mr. Wayne Diebenike and he's the Chief Executive Officer of Alta. And he's going to talk us about where and what is the origin of corruption and how should we fix this? Thank you, Wayne, for your continued support as usual. We really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks. Harry, thanks, Mike. I'm going to put up my presentation. I was going to find it. This one here. Uh, just 
tell me if it's the right screen. We need, we need to go to presentation mode. There, yeah. that's Is it there? perfect. Do I perfect. sort the displays or are you happy? No, it's okay. fine. It's fine. Lovely. Okay, thanks. Thanks very much. All right, so look, um, I'm just going to give an overview of, I think we all understand corruption, but there's a little bit of a background, but then talk more to what the issues are in this country and what we have to do. Uh, and uh, it, it's, I think there's a lot of good signs that are coming out at the moment, but we'll discuss those. So in short, you know, corruption is, is, is a form of dishonesty uh, by people, usually in, in positions of authority, and, and it is to uh, uh, illicitly uh, acquire funds for, for, them, for themselves. Essentially, it is the abuse of power for private gain. Um, but it's not new. You know, we, we, we think that uh, uh, corruption here, because we see it, it's, it's becoming, a, it's in our face. Uh, it's becoming a bigger problem, but it's been around for centuries, uh, since the dawn of public authority. You know, this uh, notion of greasing the wheels of the system uh, has been a reality. And, and the sad thing is that the poor suffer the most because when you operate and find your country or your environment is, is, is fraught with corruption, the people who can afford to grease the wheels, the people who can afford to get to the front of the queue, to get their tenders in, uh, to get the business, uh, the rich just get richer and the poor suffer. The poor who cannot buy their licenses, who cannot participate in corrupt processes suffer the most. And this creates a bigger imbalance, uh, inequality grows and it becomes a, a big problem. The loser in corruption is the state or the shareholders. And that's why we have laws and policies to prevent it. And it's very important that, uh, that we ensure our laws are put to, uh, uh, to the test and to good use. And, and it's when the laws are circumvented uh, is when corruption uh, grows. And I think, the, I think that people try and equate this to uh, a formula, if you want. And corruption does unfold when the gains are greater than the penalty. And we've seen this very often. The penalty can be very small for, 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 for millions of rands gained. Uh, and so it becomes quite lucrative. And then you times it by the likelihood of escaping prosecution. And if your prosecution of criminal justice system is compromised, uh, then it gets worse. Large-scale corruption or grand corruption, as we know, is when corruption permeates everyday structure of society on a national level. And this is the case in a number of countries. Nigeria is, is one. Uh, there are, are many, Venezuela, South America, there's countries uh, that you cannot do business. Many of Central African countries, you cannot do business unless you add in the factor of corruption, the cost of corruption. And it gives rise to organized crime, police become involved, the system pretty much collapses. It's a, it's a systemic and endemic uh, issue. Uh, and, and, and this generally happens uh, when there is a weakness in the organizational processes, where officials then uh, act corruptly within a system. The more manual, the more paper-based, the more cash-based your systems are, uh, you find that corruption becomes systemic and endemic, the more you can hide things. And the beauty of uh, a move in the pandemic has certainly given rise to the electrification, electronic or digitization of business uh, you see now, now more and more places where you go to shop, there's less and less cash being accepted, more and more uh, only credit cards, only electronic payments uh, to circumvent corruption. We need to move into the digital age a lot faster. And I think the pandemic is, is getting our government to realize that they've got no choice but to move there. So here are some of the factors that encourage uh, the systemic corruption. And this is conflicting in Incentives, so I get a salary, but I can get more. We've seen this in the traffic police departments. We, we've heard of traffic policemen who have been offered promotions, uh, uh, sizable increases in salaries to take administration jobs, and they don't want to do that because there's more money to be made. And the incentives of, of stopping and, uh, uh, and bribing uh, road users. Uh, when people are given discretionary powers, uh, especially in a monopolistic environment, uh, where there's a lack of transparency and a culture of impunity, in other words, you'll get away with uh, it, you won't be held accountable. Those are the factors that encourage the deep systemic corruption. And in many countries, corruption is the expected behavior rather than the exception in many countries. Some would say in most countries, and the question for us in South Africa is, are we there? 
yet. Uh, the question then gets a little bit deeper. How do we see corruption? Is it an individualistic act of deviant behavior or has it become institutionalized as, as informal rules and routines that place pressure on you and I as individuals to perform according to these norms? What do you do? Do you expect to pay bribes? Do you expect to act in a manner that is corrupt or out of the, uh, out of the boundaries of the rule of law? Uh, when it comes to tendering, when it comes to doing business with government? Uh, and, uh, you know, has our basic norm become the unavoidability of bribes? That's when you need to start worrying. I don't think we're there yet. Um, it does become a problem uh, when, when uh, it becomes exacerbated when the police start getting involved and your, and your criminal justice system becomes compromised. And we do see police in this country involved in, uh, in, in, in crimes. We see uh, the drug lords in many cities paying off bribes to police. Uh, we see a lot of involvement in the police. We need to uh, make sure that, that that doesn't get any worse uh, and tackle those problems. So the likelihood of endemic or systemic corruption in South Africa, if the Jacob Zuma administration had continued to be in place, is that we would be in a far worse position right now. I think uh, personally we've uh, dodged a bullet. Um, some do regard corruption as systemic in many areas uh, in, in, our organ in, in our country uh, in doing business with the state, but it's not entrenched in others. Uh, the past decade of state capture has had the impact of triggering grand corruption because it has driven impunity uh, by weakening the uh, criminal justice system, and it has virtually perpetuated the do-as-I-do environment. Uh, and we see the catered deployment processes that are taking place in the political space and how this has given rise to endemic corruption in local governments. Many municipalities are absolutely broke because of gross maladministration and corruption. And you've got to ask yourself this question, how is it possible that one family of three brothers and others have become so enriched to the tune of billions of rands at the expense of you and I? And let's unpack that and we'll go, go through a few uh, graphs and tables. These are the three parts of government systems uh, and they are very much intertwined with each other. They cannot operate uh, without each other. Um, uh, all three need to be in place and more so in local government. Firstly, you have the community and all the public who elect the pro political structures and they appoint and oversee the administration. And it is the administration that works for you and I, the public. They put in place all the processes that ensure we have a well-oiled uh, government and all the infrastructures and the systems that we need to do business and to live uh, and, and to grow uh, prosperously in the country. Uh, that's the role of, of the administration. The sad reality is the, um, that political structures have captured or interfered or manipulate and hijack the administration uh, of our uh, government and our towns and our cities and they start working more for uh, the, po the political masters and less for the community. And that's where you have a breakdown in the system. The communities become ignored. Corruption and maladministration sets in. The systems start to collapse. And as I said, this is, this is uh, very prevalent in the local government space at the moment. The art of state capture, because it gives one a sense of how easy this was to take place, it, even though it was quite interested, but uh, uh, intricate. Sorry, it, it is a, it is literally a planned plundering. I call it of the public purse, a bit of alliteration there, but it was well orchestrated, and it just needed a few elements to be put in place. Uh, people on the inside, these are the people who control the state's resource spending. People on the outside who bid for the expenditure projects. Uh, largely and not, uh, uh, not as, as, as tight as that, but they would want to do business with government. And then what you needed to do, uh, as we saw happening, you need to stifle the enforcement agencies, the NPA, the Hawks. Uh, remember the Scorpions um, who were just literally removed because they played uh, a big role in uncovering grand corruption. Uh, so you need to, if you can effectively stifle uh, and ignore, uh, get the, get the uh, law enforcement agencies to slow down and, and not investigate the wrongdoing. Uh, that helps a lot in state capture. 
And then there's another element which we talk about often, and that is to attract, uh, to, to introduce an attractive funding landscape, which is too good to ignore and you, and you get funding uh, institutions uh, providing the funds uh, to government backed guarantees. Uh, so you get the bond auctions that, that, that the funding houses and lending houses participate in, investors, uh, and they are lured there by government backed guarantees. And this is the type of stuff and the debt that this country has got into that Mike talks about uh, that has put us in an extremely precarious position. Uh, the hole is much deeper than it should ever have been. So let me show you, show you what happened. Enabling the outside, you need, you, you need to have people outside the system to, to, to be the pool, to get the money out of the system. These are business people. They have sufficient networks to cover a variety of business interests. Uh, they meet, uh, they need to meet the political infrastructure and the transformation agenda. They need to be able to move and launder proceeds, preferably offshore. If you really do want to uh, get money out of the system and out of the country, you want to, you want to, uh, you want to launder it well in, in, in an offshore environment. We saw a lot of that happening in Transnet uh, with the uh, Chinese rail manufacturers. We'll talk a little bit about that. And you need people who can lobby and convince various internal players, people inside the government system of their roles, uh, because if you can get them to do that role for you as well, you'll shield the kingpins, the people within government from being implicated. That's why you find very few emails from Jacob Zuma, who was the kingpin of state capture uh, and all his, the, 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 the henchmen within the Gupta uh, networks, the Cillian S's of the world did all the uh, moving of, of people and contracts and so into the Gupta brothers, into this fray of being the enablers of the outside, uh, the controllers of, of, of state capture from the outside. Capturing the inside, uh, the, we saw what happened, uh, and this is, this is an excellent case study and internationally uh, would be used going forward on how you do capture a, a country. So um, what you have is uh, Jacob Zuma elected as the state president, uh, Sorry about that. Um, I don't know if my screen has gone off, Mike. When we can, yeah, that's, that's fine again, thank you. All right, so um, he was a state capture, uh, uh, sorry, so Jacob Zuma elected as the president in, in, of the ANC in 2007 within 15 months. He becomes the president of the country, he reshuffles his cabinet on the 31st uh, of October. Uh, in 2010, he appoints new ministers, ministers that become amenable to promoting the Gupta's plans. Uh, then ministers uh, appoint the new boards, it's specifically as state-owned entities, uh, and it is in state-owned entities that a lot of the uh, expenditure, the uh, capital expenditure that took place, and you heard those in the uh, State of the Nation speeches by Jacob Zuma over that time, a lot of money being injected into the economy uh, through the state. And it was, it was convenient to have ministers then appointing the new boards um, in this space. Uh, then you have the boards appointing the new CEOs and, and chief finance officers. Uh, senior managers then are and procurement and treasury heads are appointed in SOEs. And they are all appointed uh, to align with this great plan of, uh, and grand plan of state capture. Uh, then what you need to do is, is, is disempower uh, government structures. New ministers uh, enabled new shareholder compacts to regulate the functions of boards and, and board members, so they were given a lot more powers uh, and authority to decide over higher financial transactions without uh, getting the approvals of National Treasury. Remember in the past, National Treasury uh, had a lot to do with enabling the uh, flow of funds and the decisions made in SOEs, a lot of those barriers were removed and boards uh, were able to develop a new financial risk frameworks and empower those chief executives with higher delegations of authority. Um, and SOEs were enabled to appoint their own service providers now outside of, of, of the government procurement processes. Uh, big kickback payments uh, were, were, were then were able to be negotiated. Prices of services uh, were increased to cover kickbacks. And so we saw the cost of, of uh, locomotives, we saw the cost of building, of road building, uh, all infrastructure expenditure through government over the last decade has increased uh, tremendously as a result uh, of the bribes and kickbacks that were negotiated. 
And then what happens is the government creates a fictitious demand uh, and tenders are awarded. So you see this and right down to uh, local government learns from national government. Uh, and, and, and you see the need, uh, fictitious demand put in place for right down to water tanks and water supplies. Uh, locomotives, as I said, uh, uh, the amount of construction that needs to take place in, in specific areas that is absolutely unnecessary uh, in these confinement and sometimes uh, disguised as emergency procurements. And payment to service providers is often made very quickly, very quickly. Sometimes you see the payment and the deposits made by government to, to institutions that win these awards. Uh, and, and, and very often you'll see that they, the, the, service and the, the, public, uh, the Auditor General reports on this very, very often. Uh, and it's very, really sad to see that, uh, that we can have roads sometimes, uh, service providers building roads, they, they don't even get a quarter of the way. Uh, the money's all been paid and, uh, and, and they've headed for the hills and just collapsed those companies. Procurement policies and prescripts of the PFMA then and the Companies Act are largely neglected by executives who claim to act inside their mandates. Uh, and again, there are many court cases. Just yesterday, Arta was in, uh, in, in, in the court cases around the oil gate, uh, the strategic fuel stock reserves being sold. So state-owned entities have been the, the playing fields of state capture. And I'm going to show you a few graphs here just so that you start to understand what happened. Um, this is the, this is Transnet's assets versus liabilities, and the next uh, few slides I'll show you as well. Just take note of how the assets of these state-owned entities were increased, uh, and what that did allow it allows a lovely, healthy balance sheet uh, against which uh, these state-owned entities could go and borrow money, and you see the interest-bearing debt starting to grow uh, as these um, as these liabilities start growing. Now, in reality. Um, well, in theory, uh, and, and the IFRS uh, accounting laws will allow as, uh, assets to be revalued in any organization so long as you can justify that value. The problem with our state-owned entities is the justification of the revaluing of assets that are not tradable is a big concern. But nonetheless, they did this and it made the, uh, it made the financials look healthy. And against that backdrop, uh, they were able to go and borrow billions and billions of rupees. The same thing with Denal. And this trend, by the way, if you look at it, it all started from 2009 as Jacob Zuma came into power, 2010, 2011. All of these state-owned institutions started revaluing their assets uh, and, and started borrowing against it. Eskom is a particularly interesting one. If you look at Eskom in 2007, before the Madupi and Kusili matter started, um, uh, just uh, around about 70 billion rand was the value of their, uh, of their assets, their properties. Uh, and, and you see how that grew. And that didn't grow just as a result of Madupi and Kusili. Madupi and Kusili was budgeted at 140 billion rand between the two of them. Had they built it uh, on time, uh, that would be the asset value of this institution right now. And look at where it has gone up to. But what they did is uh, enable them to push up this interest-bearing debt. Uh, so their liabilities have grown. Uh, and now, uh, and I think the, the latest figures, this is over 400 billion rand, close to 450 billion rand of debt that is a noose around the neck of Eskom, which you and I have to pay an increased electricity costs. This is one of the biggest sins that this country has had. And still today, Madupi and Kusili are not finished at a price tag, which started out as 140 billion rand, uh, closer to 500 billion rand. And nobody, nobody has been held accountable. And this is the shocking reality of a manipulation, quite frankly, of, um, of financial uh, management. Same thing with uh, Sanral. Uh, you know, the road network didn't climb. They've taken over a number of uh, regional roads. Uh, but this massive increase in value of assets uh, is, is just fictitious because, quite frankly, uh, you might want to value your, your, our roads uh, because of the land value that these highways traverse through cities and that at, at, at higher rates. That's fine. Uh, according to IFRS, you can do this, the International Financial Reporting System. But the reality is if you're in trouble as an organization, you sell your assets. Well, Sentinel can't sell its roads. Eskim cannot sell its power stations. They are not valued where they should be. They do not have that material value. 
Uh, and so what happens again as well is uh, Sandral is able to increase its borrowings, liabilities from 14 to 120, 102 billion rand over that period. Uh, and it just is quite a farce. And I think the, the dilemma that has arisen from these increased state-owned entity uh, asset values today, as I said, while they're allowed to do this, are state-owned entity assets regarded as tradable? They're not. Because what happens is if you're in trouble, as Sanral finds itself, as Eskom finds itself in, well, the normal reality in any business is if you're in trouble and you're in debt and you need to get out of debt, you need to sell some of your assets. That's not going to happen. It cannot happen. And it will never be able to happen uh, in this case of these state and entities. So it's, it's quite a farce, actually. So what is the real value of those assets? And, 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 and this is a question that we asked finance houses, is, is, is would those finance institutions taken up and gone to those bond auctions of those SOEs if these were just pure JSE listed companies with no guarantees from government? And the short answer is no, they wouldn't have. They would never have invested and taken up those bonds. So now we have investments in, in defunct uh, entities in government. And, and, and we believe that, that there is unethical lending to SOEs that took place by the finance houses. And quite frankly, in the, in the, these state and entities, Eskom and others, uh, are bound by the JSE rules. A question for the JSE is why are you silent about the SOE asset values? Because you need to go and have a look at those values. Certainly the power stations uh, that we have, uh, you could never recover the value of those assets. Uh, uh, nobody would buy a half our power stations for a rand, quite frankly, because of the future of where energy is going and how inefficient they've become. So now I just want to uh, talk a little bit about um, the solutions. How do, we, how do we fight corruption? Well, the well-known adage is transparency is the enemy of corruption. And we need to force transparency. We need to do this by ensuring that uh, board appointments uh, have greater public participation. What happens right now, and to this day, we are fighting a number of matters uh, with board appointments at CETAs, at board appointments uh, in, 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 in Urba and many other areas where, where this is not an open process. The public have got no say. Um, but we have seen recently uh, public, uh, uh, the, the, the um, public protector interviews are now enc encouraging a lot more participation. Uh, think recently of the Auditor General candidates, uh, where society is now getting involved in seeing the CVs and, and making recommendations to government. Uh, but we need to see a lot more of that. We need to see open and transparent tender process. And I think government has this notion that if they have an open tender system, it's transparent. It isn't. We need to see uh, the transparency in the tender process uh, go a lot deeper throughout the, uh, uh, the whole journey of the, of the procurement. A seat available uh, uh, for civil society on tender committees, uh, we need to see that. And as I said, at all stages of procurement, a good example of that is, how is it possible that in the Eastern Cape we can pay 20 million rand uh, for, a, for 14 toilets, or whatever that amount was? If, the, if there's transparency with those transactions way before the money changes hands, uh, we'd be able to stop that as society. Uh, the reality is that a lot of the uh, tendering and, and, and the procurement that takes place takes place behind closed doors. And then we need the public to gain access to central supplier databases. As we've seen in the COVID corruption recently, the, uh, the amount of tendering that took place and transactions that took place, uh, it had we have had a, at sight of that central supplier database, the companies that were being given those tenders, uh, the companies that never existed three months before, uh, or, or during COVID, uh, at the start of COVID, didn't exist, no trading experience, uh, participating in multi-million rand tenders. So transparency is such a critical element and every step of the way that we can drive transparency into the procurement processes, I think the more and more society is going to raise those flags a lot earlier. Uh, and when you can stop the money from changing hands is when you stop corruption. We also need to work hard in the policy space. Uh, I think we only realize the importance of government oversight organizations when they play their role well. I mean, who heard of the role that the public protector played before Tuli Mado and Sela came on board? Who knows who the, uh, uh, the auditor generals were pre-Kimi Makwetu? These are two people that have shown the worth and the value of those organizations. 
and how valuable they are to society. We need uh, to get their standards entrenched into those organizations going forward. We need to limit subcontracting and consultants. The amount of subcontracting that takes place in local government specifically, where government have uh, employees to do the work and yet they subcontract. They subcontract the whole financial departments out uh, and they get consultants to do the financials and yet people earn salaries for doing nothing. We need to prohibit the public and the officials and family from doing business with the state. This needs to become policy uh, in this country. You can, you've got to make a choice. If you want to become a public servant, you serve the people. You do not serve yourself and your, uh, and your family with lucrative contracts. Uh, we need to ensure tax clearance certificates take place on all public procurement now. CIPC registration of going concern requirements. I don't know how the state is able to do business with companies that have had no track record in the industries that they're supposed to be uh, uh, supplying services to the, to the government. In. Uh, we need to remove political interference. Uh, think of SAA and ESKIM uh, and, and, and municipalities. Uh, we need to ensure that political interference doesn't take place anymore and limit this notion of prepayments. We need to get guarantees before these prepayments are, not, are made. And then the, other, the, the, the one very big element around fighting corruption is accountability. We need to address the NPA, the, 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 uh, the ID, the uh, independent directorate, the Hawks, and the capacity shortfalls there. Uh, we need to hold uh, uh, tendering entity directors liable. And, that, and we include the entire supply chain here uh, because a lot of people are aware of what's happening. We saw yesterday in the oil gate matter how the people that were buying the oil knew that they were breaking the law. Um, we need harsher penalties, we need lifestyle audits, uh, re-energizing the assets forfeiture unit, a brilliant, a brilliant bit of legislation and, and, uh, and, and an organization that can help us fight corruption has just been allow allowed to uh, lie in waste and we need to re-energize that. And uh, we think another way of fast tracking the fight against corruption is to introduce specialized corruption courts. Um, and then just to finish off, you know, in, in, impunity in the past, is, uh, it has fostered greed. It has clouded people's judgments and ethics. And when the rule of law flows, uh, we can assure you that accountability is assured. What we need to do is get the rule of law going. Uh, we've got so much information about corruption. You see it coming through in the, in, 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 in the various uh, court processes uh, and, 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 and Judge Zonda, the Zonda Commission. Uh, a lot of information is... Uh, has been uh, put forward. And I think if we can make corruption more difficult and, and less rewarding, if we up the stakes uh, in, in, in this fight uh, against corruption, we'll be able to get there a lot faster. Uh, so fortunately, we have the information and, uh, and we need to start using it. The digital fingerprints of corruption live on forever and they surface as leadership changes. As we saw, uh, you know, who's in power today is not necessarily in power tomorrow. Uh, and all of that impunity that people, they could see the brazenness of people's conduct. Well, now they're being uh, 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 found out and now the evidence is there. And it is there um, in, in the Gupta leaks, the Trillion leaks, uh, the regiment service, bank accounts, emails, so much information to hold uh, these individuals to account. So, so I think um, my last slide, I just want to appeal uh, to people to understand that uh, you know we can fix this but we need to uh, hold government's feet to the fire and generate to create an appetite for the change in this space uh, as i said earlier we think things are happening uh, the more exposure and heat that we can provide as civil society in this landscape of corruption it will start to change so what we do need to become is active citizens, but not just individuals, businesses as well. Businesses need to go beyond this business as usual uh, attitude. We see far too much business who literally uh, hate crossing swords with government because they do business with government, uh, but yet they will, they will tender and they'll participate even though they know what they're doing is wrong. It's not in the best interest of society. So we need, we need a moral courage and we need uh, ethical conduct to start taking place a lot more in that space. We need to also support and cherish the courageous and balanced uh, uh, media houses that we have and freedom of speech. Uh, we need to support credible civil society efforts that hold people to account. And I just want to implore that we never give up hope just because the progress is slow. It doesn't mean to say we're not going to win this. 
uh, fight and we're not going to be able to improve our plights as a country. But we need to work harder on efforts to speed up this progress. And I think in, in light of what Mike was saying as well, uh, aside from the fact that there's this corrupt issue, we need to speed up the process of government policy because the hole that we're in right now, I can assure you, we can get out of it a lot faster if government just took its eye off the ball of serving its own interests and started serving the interests of society and the prosperity of this nation, we can become the country that the world would want to invest in. We can become the country that the world wants to travel and tourism can, can grow far faster uh, than what it is today. But we need government to understand it has a bigger role to play. And with that, I will uh, finish this presentation. and Thank you for your time. Well, oh, thank you. Thank you, Wayne. This was, uh, I don't know if I can say it's encouraging. <laughs> What's the right word? <laughs> fictitious encouragement. <laughs> the fictitious demand was extremely concerning. And, uh, you know, we all pay our taxes and uh, maybe we can use fictitious money to pay those taxes. Mm -hmm. uh, where's our level in comparison of other countries in terms of paying tax? Um, I think that's also concerning. But Wayne, thank you. Let me not waste the people's time. I would love for you and Mike Schussler to partake now in the questions and answers session. So Mike, if you can also kindly unmute yourself and uh, let's give the, the audience opportunity. Let's start off. Are there any uh, journalists who would like to unmute first and uh, ask questions to Mike and uh, Wayne? Uh, let's give them opportunity first. Okay, it doesn't seem that there's a, there's a journalist in this stage. Um, anybody else from the audience would like to unmute and ask a question? I see there are a number of questions in the chat room, which we'll address now, but anybody want to unmute? Angeline, you want to ask a question? Thank you very much, Harry. <laughs> Long time. Also, <clears throat> I would like to appreciate the two presentations. I'm Angeline Chavele. I'm in the Department of Transport. You know, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, I want to link the two questions, uh, the two, uh, my comment uh, to, to Mike, um, as well as to Wei. You know, it is a little bit worry when one looks at the state of the economy and the recovery projections. It's going to take us long, I mean, in terms of the graphs that have indicated. But, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, my, my point is that when you look at the value, now linking this point to, to Wade, when you look at the asset of the SOE, it's a pity that you did not flag the raw train asset in terms of its value. But uh, the asset affect the value of commercial property. I do know in terms of uh, presidential infrastructure, strategic infrastructure plans and framework, there are certain assets that were going to be used to yield some revenue or income. The, the properties, for example, around uh, Midupi, Kusile, the Rao train, as well as the Rao freeway improvement scheme, they yield some value in terms of uh, uh, when, you when you sell, as well as the business business uh, property in terms of rental. Now with this incorrect valuation and the collapse, so to speak, of the of business in CBDs, which impact on transport and tourism, is, is there a way we could try to model to model us as a country and certain SOE to revisit their loan agreements and repurpose the function of the, uh, of the assets or, or infrastructure that they're having while at the same time negotiating lower terms for repayment. <clears throat> mm. Thank you, Angeline. Um, the, let's <laughs> take a question. I see uh, Terry Markham. Terry, you want to ask a question? <laughs> Uh, yes, it's a very brief question. I suppose it's really to Wayne. Hi, Wayne. Um, okay. Wayne, uh, you talk about, I mean, I'm an engineer, so I don't understand balance sheets. But 
ESCOM does have assets. Mm. And let's be extreme about it and say the assets are worth 10 Rand. Isn't it better to sell the assets for 10 Rand than for nothing? I mean, we, the taxpayer, are going to have to pay whatever it is, the 450 billion Rand. If we can get a few hundred billion, let's say 20, 30, 40, 100 billion Rand for selling the assets, it means we've got to pay 350 billion Rand. Uh, and of course, there is a big asset that they've got, and that is the grid. Mm -hmm. uh, and nobody talks about it, but you could certainly sell that off either 100% of it or half of it. And I don't know. I mean, I, somebody once said to me it was worth many, many billions, 100 billion rand. But my argument would be that for two reasons. One is let's get some money, which is better than no money. And secondly, if the private sector takes over running the, uh, the, 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 the stations, we'll be better off. Thanks. Thank you, Terry. Um, Wayne, you're welcome to respond to the questions. Yeah, uh, let me let me just respond uh, in, in, in this way. I, I think the the reason I showed those graphs is that is that the values of those assets were placed there um, to attract uh, uh, financial houses, and they were government guaranteed bonds. And that's the problem with, that we have is now uh, our, our sovereignty has been indebted to to servicing or backing those bonds, uh, and uh, and and that's the risk we have. So we have a debt. Uh, that that Mike shows in the graphs uh, that that we uh, that we are going to struggle to repay, and in that short space of time, the revaluing of the assets in state-owned entities, and by, by the way, businesses revalue their assets as well. But generally speaking, when a business revalues its assets because let's say its building that it owns is, is now opposite the car train and its value goes up, you can do that. There's nothing wrong with that. The the law allows you to do that, but but it's done in a way that it is tradable. The asset is a real asset that you can sell. The problem with the state is that, A, it's not going to sell its power stations. It cannot, there are laws. Uh, the state doesn't sell its roads. It can privatize them on a, on a concessionaire basis uh, to have them uh, expanded through a tolling mechanism, let's say the N3TC, those, that, that type of uh, public-private partnership or build, operate, and transfer mechanism to finance infrastructure is a is a well-known one, and it's well used, and there's nothing wrong with it. It's when the value of the asset has no meaning, um, and these institutions are guided uh, and also compelled to uh, you know work within the laws of of, of business uh, and the JSE's laws. Uh, the question we've got for the JSC is, what are you going to do? Why don't you go and sit down with Eskom and say, how do you realize this value? Because the reality in business is if you cannot realize or show the auditors, that's the value of your company and your assets. You have to devalue them again. And what would happen right now if government was forced to devalue the value of those assets in Eskom and in uh, and in Sanral and at Transnet? Well, we'd be in absolute trouble. We'd in case. So this is this is fictitious money on paper. It is at absolute no value. The sad reality is that the lending houses gave that money to these SOEs on the back of these guarantees only because the, the government guaranteed them the bonds. They would never have given that money. And so I question the ethics of lending houses and their role. And then to come to, to uh, Angeline's question, you're quite right. This is the time and the opportunity to go and revalue, to do the deals with the lending houses. PRC gave uh, Sanral 20 billion rand for the road upgrade, which would double the price of what it should have been. This is the time that together with the finance institutions and world banks and whoever, we need to, to uh, renegotiate the settlements and the bonds and the interests. It's not easy, it's very difficult, but it's, it's going to take that type of intervention to ease the pain that we're in right now. I'm sure Mike's got some points he can add. Thank you, Wayne. Mike? Yeah, I'd just like to say, you know, it, we, we're now at a crossroads. We don't have enough savings in the country uh, to bail us out. We will have to rely uh, very much on foreign savings. Now, the question is, how do we attract those foreign savings? Do we, as Wayne uh, was talking about privatization or um, Terry as well? Uh, yes, you can sell ESCOM, but you need to change the rules. For example, um, if you think Ethiopian Airlines uh, would like to buy SAA, 
At the moment, they're only allowed to buy 25% of SAA. I don't think SAA is profitable. I, well, we know it isn't. And uh, we need to find somebody that can bail them out effectively. And they're not going to want to be a, 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 a minority partner if they do. Um, so effectively, I think if we look at that, um, South Africa has assets that we can sell, whether it's the airports or whether it's the power stations or whether it's, uh, I don't know, the spectrum on the, uh, uh, for cell phone operators. Um, but even that is not going to be enough to help us out everywhere. And essentially, the population will still pay for that. We'll still have to pay the airport company per passenger or per plane that lands. We're probably going to have to pay. Well, we will continue paying for electricity. Um, so we're at the crossroads where we have to make these sort of decisions. What do we privatize? What can we privatize? What makes sense? Um, because we need to do a lot of that. Um, some assets, however, are not worth much. And it's very difficult to see how we are going to get away with that. For example, um, it's not known uh, very well, but Prasa gets a big state subsidy. And if anybody buys Prasa, they would still get that state subsidy. The other problem with uh, Prasa at the moment, or all these sort of public transport type of uh, assets and others um, that have a social uh, good to attach to it, is that there's been a lot of damage to the properties and so on. In Prasa's case, it's been ongoing with burning trains, but now during the lockdown, uh, even railway lines have been uh, stolen. It was on carte blanche, and I've got photos from other people, um, journalists uh, who took the track all the way from Joburg to Randfontein, and a lot of those tracks are gone. Uh, if you replace the tracks, you still have to think of the overhead cable, so then you have to, in the meantime, go diesel, which costs you more. Um, you know, every piece of scrap metal uh, in many of those spa uh, stations from the sink roof uh, and the door handles and everything has been removed. The toilets have been removed. Um, it's a crying shame that that was allowed to happen. So you cannot sell something like that. Uh, you know, you, you, it's too much money to pour in. So we have to make decisions what the state will still sponsor and what the state will not sponsor. And that's why I think Prasa might be uh, finding themselves in a surprising situation where government says, we just can't do this anymore. And uh, the, the same with Gautrain. Gautrain gets a sponsorship of about 2 billion rand a year, not sponsorship, but a government uh, subsidy. Um, and now that there's less people um, on that, it's uh, not got enough passengers to even make the minimum requirements. So now uh, the operator is making a loss. Um, that is a private partnership with the uh, 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 Gauteng uh, government, but it is a loss. And I don't think private firms are in uh, for a loss. And it's unlikely that as many people as before will use the car train very quickly because if the work from home continues, um, then I think it's going to be one of those factors that's going to play a big role. And then the other thing is international um, travel. So the line in that case to OR Tambo is not going to be fully optimized uh, and used because it's quite frankly uh, problematic uh, that there's not going to be enough airplanes. And the second thing is, um, if you live and you want to go door to door, Uber is actually a very good competitor to the, to the car train. And uh, so it, it, it becomes difficult to see how some of these, and I'm just using them, those two as examples, there are others, um, how we can make it work. And the fact of the matter is, um, it's a, 
it's a huge amount of money that is needed. Uh, the South African savings pool, even with our pension funds, is not big enough. Um, we cannot um, close all these gaps. We are going to go over 100% of GDP um, with our debt to GDP ratio. And just, that's just the government debt. Um, that's not state-owned enterprises debt. That's going to be another 25% or so. Our um, assets uh, in our pension funds were equal and long-term insurance and short-term insurance are equal to a little bit over GDP now, but they, but they have come down uh, because the JSE and so on has declined. And you can't put all the assets in one basket because you also need to invest in the private sector. Where was the private, where's the private sector going to get money from? So South Africa is going to have to look at uh, other uh, places to get money. And once we do that, or we've been doing that for a long time, but once that becomes more and more, uh, the demands are going to become more and more. Um, so it's quite easy for now to scrape some money together uh, from the international institutions uh, like the IMF and the World Bank, uh, who are not going, who are charging us less in interest um, than we would normally get. But I think after this, it's going to become very, very difficult, and we're going to have to give up some of our rules uh, that we've put self constraints on ourselves. For example, why should a South African airline be only 25% owned by uh, foreigners? Uh, what do we actually want? We want airlines that fly people from place to place and uh, 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 have competition in the skies uh, so that the consumer has choices. And uh, if we need to, we should get uh, uh, international guys to work with that. Uh, the same to the, the telecommunications industry. There's a whole host of things and we need to free up uh, the monopolies that we have. We have an airport company monopoly, we have a harbor monopoly, we have a rail monopoly, um, a, a freight rail monopoly. We need to uh, address those. And uh, once we do that, we will see more people play on the tracks, uh, for example, on rail. And we also need to educate people that you can't go around stealing national infrastructure, like, for example, uh, electricity cables or um, cables over line cables for a, a, a railway line, or in fact, even the railway line. Uh, we need to have people that um, understand that. And we need to have uh, some very good examples of the people that they catch with that. I agree with Wayne, uh, you know, that it's, it's, it's not just the corruption, though. Yeah, it's plain um, criminality, but we need to address that and the corruption um, to be able to have a, a, an economy that works and provides jobs for people. There's no other way out of it. I mean, the poorest of the poor workers are the ones that use Prasa, and Prasa is unable to operate at the moment. It is not operating. It's a simple fact. Caltrain is too expensive for the poor, for the poor and even they are making losses. So, I don't know how we're going to uh, sort this out without uh, somebody addressing the corruption. And because at Prasa there was corruption, Wayne can tell you more, I'm sure. Um, and and they were, they, there's plain theft. I mean, um, in, in I think it's the East Rand, um, just past uh, Boxburg or something, um, the, the, the railway line has been removed. There's uh, um, a Fosseris or Township, I think it is. Uh, cannot get Prasa rail because the, the rail track's been removed. I mean, and it was removed on the West Rand side as well and replaced, but they don't have much more to replace. So it's a nightmare. Yeah, quite concerning. Thank you, Mike. Um, let's quickly scan um, through the chat room here. I see yeah, Marco Chetty is saying that uh, he hopes that the government and powers to be will see these presentations. I can mention again for those who joined later is the presentations will be uploaded to the transfer forums website, you will be able to download them from the downloads feature on that website. Um, Richard Bennett, um, Richard, I don't know, you've got uh, two or three questions here, wouldn't you unmute yourself and you can ask them directly to the panel? Is it possible? Yes, Harry, thank you very much. Um, appreciate the opportunity. I think, uh, Harry, just in, in linking some of the issues uh, that have been discussed today uh, with the, the 
concerns we have about browser and powertrain and the like. Uh, there's been a big focus on the transit oriented development uh, in terms of our um, cities looking at how they approve uh, new rights for uh, growth in employment opportunities. Uh, we, we keep on asking the question, that surely the focus should be on ensuring that we are creating new employment opportunities. In other words, giving permission for new development to happen close to where people are, who are really, where they really live. Um, you know, given the number of unemployed people we have, uh, we look at the areas like, so we're operating in the Gauteng region, uh, in and around Johannesburg. And we look at areas like Soweto, where there's a development opportunity right on the doorstep of Soweto. Um, surely our focus should be on ensuring that the infrastructure for new development is developed in these areas so that people can get to work quickly. Um, I, I, you know, really we've seen the move to uh, people working from home is basically confirming the desire to minimize transport time and cost. And uh, therefore people have said, right, I will work at home, which is about as close to home as you can get. Um, if we can ensure that we are focusing new development, uh, it's going to have an impact on the prizes and the car trains, um, a negative impact initially. And I like the proposal that we should be possibly then looking to refocus those transport solutions to uh, things like tourism, uh, internal tourism solutions. But really, I, I am asking the question, how do we get our cities to get their head around um, moving from transit-oriented development concepts to, to picking up the opportunities for pushing hard for development close to where people are currently living? Thank you, Richard. Um, Mike, maybe you can start. Yeah. I, I agree with Richard. I think we should allow the, the people that want to take the risk of developing wherever they can develop safely, obviously taking environment or, you know, we don't want um, some, but they should be allowed to, and it should be quite easy to do that. Um, I know uh, that at NEDLAC, they're talking about private electricity provision from the private sector, getting the go ahead in the next few days. Um, I think, you know, that we have to have these sort of discussions as a NEDLAC doesn't make sense. We should be allowing building, we should be allowing electricity uh, as much as possible. If there's somebody that wants to take the risk and put money down and do it, then great. I absolutely agree with that. Um, Richard, as to the, the city's planning and stuff, I, I am not a specialist in that, but I think we are moving to where it's no longer a, a spoken wheel, a sort of city center that then has traffic going in and out in all the directions. I think we, we, we're going to more like a, a spider's web where the, the, the people will be more uh, in their own suburbs and the meeting places will be around their suburbs. I haven't had a meeting in, in, in Santon virtually from before the lockdown, obviously, and uh, so on. But I mean, that used to be every two weeks in my life, I would have to travel to Santon. It used to be a, a, a pet um, hurt of mine or a, a pain in the bum because I didn't like Santon's traffic and everything like that. And today, that just doesn't happen. You, you, I've been to um, Waterfall uh, or Mall of Africa once, in this whole period for a business meeting. Um, what I tend to find is, first of all, there's fewer business meetings, there's more Zoom meetings. Um, but second of all, when there are business meetings where somebody wants to meet with you, you do it at a coffee shop between the two houses or um, somewhere else. So that's why I think uh, it's a very different thing. So I, I've avoided Santa and not because I wanted to, it's just the way it worked. I mean, uh, if, if, if Wayne wants to meet me now, I don't know where he stays, but we'll work out a place between us. We're not going to go uh, because he's working in, 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 in Santon or Ramberg or wherever, uh, has to be one of those hubs. It, it's not, it, it will be very different now, I think. And uh, that's if we don't meet over Zoom. So I think the, the way that cities develop from now on um, is going to be very different. The employment opportunities are going to be different. 
and you're 100% correct. We should allow any investment as quickly as possible, approve it if there's any approval to be made. I can understand health and safety approvals um, and get it going because the more red tech we have, the more opportunity there is for corruption. I'll leave it there and Wayne can answer if he wants to. Thank you, Mike. Wayne, can I post another question to you and then you can combine the answer, please? Um, if we're running out of time for this panel discussion. It's a question to Wayne from Olga Mashilu. She says, uh, Wayne, thanks for the valuable insight on how corruption implanted itself. My question is on Madupi and Kusile. Do we have a finger to point exactly? I mean, can we point the origin of corruption in those power generations to the engineers from the conceptual state, to the appointment of the main contractor who has to kick back through higher pricing on the project itself? So maybe you can go back to a few comments. Yeah. Well. So, th thanks, Olga. I think that question uh, pertains to many of our state and institutions, the boards uh, that allowed uh, uh, these uh, transactions to take place. Um, if you just so, let's just go to uh, Madupi and Kusile. This is uh, why you have a government that has the oversight and appoints boards and holds them accountable. And the boards hold all the supplying processes uh, in, in check with the, with the rules and regulations. And when you break those rules, and when you uh, allow uh, increased powers to uh, people who are put in positions to 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 enable this ongoing uh, expenditure on the Madupi and Casilia projects, um, we have the problem that we have. who do who do we blame? Though? Who do you who do you finger in this process? I think everybody is to blame. You've got to, but you've got to start at who has the oversight, who's the accountable individuals. And in Eskim's case, it is the board of Eskom and it is the chief executive officers. They've had, I think, 11 of them over the last uh, 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 nine years. Uh, forgive, you know, uh, forgive me if I'm uh, a couple of, of heads out. Now you cannot run any organization where you have continuous uh, turnover of, 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 of executives at that level and the boards themselves. But this is quite frankly, the outcome of, of a very clever plan to capture that state-owned institution. And uh, the only people that can be held accountable is government. And we have a, we have a, a constitution, a very strong one. Uh, you can't just remove the government, you have to vote them out. Uh, and, and, and that's the unfortunate process we've got. You've got to wait five years every time. And we've seen the shift in the voting patterns. Sadly, the youth are staying away uh, and, and we've got to fix that as well. But Coming back to the, the specific question, um, we now see that the current board, and this is one of the things we, we've been asking all these uh, state-owned institutions, the new boards, is to start doing the work that civil society is doing for them. They need to go after the uh, boards of the previous, uh, uh, the previous boards that got this country into the mess, or those state-owned institutions into the mess that they're in. It's not our role to go and... Uh, have Dudu Mnyani declared as a delinquent director and, and have her held accountable. It is actually the current board's role because they've got the minutes of the meetings. They've got the contract set to sign. They've got all the information where there has been a transgression against the Companies Act. And so we are now putting pressure on these current boards to do their job. We see Andre De Reiter is now doing that. He's laid charges against a number of the previous directors. And all we want now is the rule of law to flow. The evidence is there. It's very clear. And when you can go and start holding their feet to the fire of those who transgressed, uh, that is when society sits up. That's when investors start getting excited about coming back into this country because they know that if I invest in this country and the rule of law is broken, people will be held accountable. That's been missing. Uh, so we'd love to see, and we're watching with interest what happens uh, in the both the Transnet and the Eskom uh, expenditure processes that were broken, all the rules uh, by those previous directors. And we know and believe that the National Prosecuting Authority's cases are at an advanced stage. So people keep asking, when are people going to be held accountable? We believe those cases, the big fish cases, are, are imminent. Um, but it's across the board. We can't just look to have uh, a few people arrested. We need to get on top of of, of managing corruption in this country 
uh, as I pointed out a number of these steps. And I, and I do believe that the appetite that government is starting to display, and even within the ruling party, that this notion of government officials doing business with government has to stop. This notion of people being guilty, uh, you know, not, not having to be found guilty yet in the court of law, because you understand being innocent and proven guilty, but where the smoke is so thick, to still be sitting in positions of power, receiving salaries, is just unacceptable. And hopefully those changes will start taking place. So. Thank you, Wayne. Um, yeah, the smoke is thick indeed. Uh, thank you for that. Um, maybe th some closing remarks from our panelists. Uh, Mike, maybe if you can give us some closing remarks and then Wayne, thank you. Oh, my closing remarks are simple. I think um, we've seen the worst. We will get better, but to make a full recovery is going to take a lot longer than many people think. Uh, we need to address the things from corruption that Wayne was talking about to the rules how one can invest in infrastructure in South Africa, when projects can take place, allow for more competition, especially against state-owned entities. Um, and I think if we relax a lot of those things and we privatize what we can, we can find a better way forward. And uh, as our previous finance ministers said, um, Trevor Manuel, there's, this, is, this is a crisis too good to waste. So we have to reform. We, we, we're not going to spend our way out of this one if we don't get the efficiencies of the economy right. And if we do that, then I have good news for everyone. I think in 10 years time, you'll be happy to be here you'll want your children to stay here. If we don't get it right, I think we are going to be an unhappy place. That's it. Yeah. Thank you for that positive yeah. answer, Mike. Wayne? <laughs> yeah, look, I, I sincerely believe this country is poised for great things. And as Mike says, and so many people do say, this is a crisis that we've got to take the opportunities out of and not see it as doom and gloom. The hole was big before the pandemic uh, set in. It's just got deeper. Uh, and we've got to move fast enough to get out of it. Uh, if you just see the position of this country, you know, I always talk about the tourism industry. How is it possible that a country like Australia, which really has just one big rock, a, a barrier reef and a kangaroo, can have 10 times more the tourists? And it's really at the end of the world. It's further to get to from uh, uh, the, 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 in Europe, you know, you have to travel so much further to get to Aust Australia. We're on the same timeline. You get into a plane in Europe, you wake up in South Africa overnight. We've got beaches, we've got wildlife, we've got a diverse culture, setting, weather, everything going for us. And yet we make it difficult for ourselves. Uh, so we've got to look at this country differently from a government point of view. We've got to attract investment and tourism, and we've got to do that by fixing corruption, getting the rule of law in place, and make it exciting to be. If we can get that right, this will be a country with double-digit uh, growth uh, in our GDP. Uh, that's the potential. That's the opportunity. If we don't, we've wasted and squandered it, and we've got ourselves to blame. So true. Thank you so much, Wayne. Ladies and gents, let's give this uh, panelist a big hand where we said um, excellent sharing knowledge with us. We really appreciate that. Um, and we hope that you guys will, will join the Transport Forum again in future. And we'll see a lot of you. Your knowledge and your experiences is, is appreciated so much. So thank you very much for your time. We really appreciate it. Um, Ladies and gents, let's let's take a, a 10 minutes break. I will put up a, a, a stopwatch on the screen and I'll see you then in 10, 10 minutes time and we'll continue with our program. Thank you so much.
So there we go. Uh, welcome back. I hope uh, each one of you have had the opportunity to have a cup of coffee or something. Um, would like to continue with our program today. And uh, I'll be sharing my screen here with you guys. So it's still the 17th of September and uh, the Transport Forum Special Interest Group, we're talking about economic recession. Are we approaching it correctly? 17th September, 2020. Um, our next presenter for this afternoon, we've got two presentations. The first, the, the next presenter is our host, Lucille Majola, she's the Chief Executive Officer of Ubunia Group. And she's going to give us a mini tax industry economic overview. Thank you very much, Lucille. So I just want to share my screen. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, everyone, um, for joining us again. Um, thank you for also for the in, insightful um, presentations that we we had um, earlier in the day. Um, I, I I always um, listen out during the 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 the, the, the presentations um, at um, perspectives from um, the country's largest um, public transport um, provider, which is the minibus um, taxi industry and, and the role that, that, that it plays, not only in, 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 in the economy, but also moving um, the labor force, as well as just the spend um, that um, the taxi industry um, contributes to 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 um, um, household um, spending in the country. So um, I think um, what I'm going to do is that I'm I'm just going to go back to um, a, a presentation that we shared in in um, April, where we 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 looked at um, where the taxi industry was with regards to obviously its economics and its, its contributions and um, what what has since happened um, in these couple of months paints a very bleak picture of, of where the taxi industry is and I, I, I'm sure if you've been following in the in the in the media you you have learned um, quite a few things um, and a few challenges that the, the taxi industry has has been faced with to a point where um, the, the, there was um, a standoff between um, government and 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 the taxi industry. Now, um, pre-COVID, obviously, the taxi industry only had one revenue stream, and the revenue stream was um, from the fares that it collected from um, who, who were who were moving um, either to work, either to 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 school, um, and um, that revenue was drastically reduced because um, of, of the, 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 the travel that was restricted in the country. And um, we saw that the industry was only allowed to carry 70% um, capacity and we estimated a 25 billion rand um, economic revenue loss um, as well as a 30% um, loss across the entire um, industry um, value chain, which includes the financing of vehicles, insurance, um, and, and uh, 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 as well as um, fuel. Um, 
But what we did see is that there was an increase in, in the taxi industry's um, public transport market share because um, the trains were not moving um, and, and um, buses were not moving, but the taxi industry was basically um, the only mass um, public transport um, provider. Um, and what that led to is um, perhaps a discussion around um, how do we relook or reimagine or rethink um, public transportation um, in, 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 in the country. We, we also came up with um, a COVID survival pack um, for, for the minibus taxi industry. And um, some of the things that we suggested were um, a strong focus on, on regulation, on, on the structure of the minibus taxi industry, um, the introduction of, of, um, of, of technology, um, as well as um, looking at the minibus taxi industry as an ecosystem. Um, rather than just a, 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 a service for, for moving people. We, we also highlighted the need for industry data uh, as well as um, the need for um, a new game plan um, for, for the minibus taxi industry for it um, to, 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 to survive. Um, we are now in September and um, with a lot that has that has happened, um, uh, we saw a strike in 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 Gauteng, and we we saw proposed strikes in in KZN um, coming from um, the minibus taxi industry structures. So um, what what actually happened is that there was a big political play um, from from the industry's um, structures, and the industry then moved to a hundred percent. Um, carrying capacity, um, the losses in the industry. Um, we, we, we saw that across the value chain, the number is actually now sitting at um, 32%. Um, market share with the return of, of, of buses and um, the train, we saw the, the industry moving back to a 78%. And I think it's still a 78% because um, of what has happened with the Praza infrastructure. Um, over the years, we have seen a decline in, in ridership for, for, the, for the train. And those riders um, have slowly migrated to, to the minibus taxi industry. Now, with, 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 the, with the challenges of infrastructure in, in, in Praza and the unavailability of trains in, in, in some areas, we saw that um, the minibus taxi industry has actually captured um, those um, commuters. Now, um, the big one that um, has everybody interested now is um, the bold move by Minister Figi Lemba Lula in, in efforts to um, say, let's reimagine the taxi industry. Let's um, speak about the big word formalization. Um, let's unpack it. Let's see what it means. Because at its current state, what we do know is that it will take um, over two years for the taxi industry to recover from just the, 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 the couple of months of um, carrying 70% um, capacity as, as well as um, restricted um, movement of, 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 of commuters. Um, in general, what we have seen in, in, in um, public um, transport is that um, with a decline in car sales, there has been um, less incentive to invest in, in um, road capacity. Public transport has generally declined uh, by 70 to 90% in major cities globally. And this is not just um, in, in, in South Africa. And perhaps South Africa is the anomaly because if you are looking at um, the, 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 the South African um, economy as an emerging um, economy, um, not many people um, have access to, pr to private 
um, vehicles. So they do use um, public transportation. So perhaps South Africa is sitting at closer to 70% than um, at, at closer to 70% than um, the 90% in, 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 in decline. Um, and uh, sorry, um, strategic choices, um, obviously that, that have become available um, for, for um, the Department of Transport and, and most other transport players is that um, there needs to be an accelerated transition to, to um, sustainable transport as well as to loosen regulatory standards. Um, and in the South African context, um, the, the move was to um, try and see how we can um, regulate the minibus taxi industry. And through regulation, we are talking about formalizing the taxi industry so that it, 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 it can um, play a, 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 a more um, controlled um, role in, 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 in public transportation. The bounce back strategy, um, according to the Department of Transport, obviously, um, response, re recovery and um, adaptation, um, still a long way. Um, I think with the Lohota that was held um, earlier, um, um, the, uh, in, 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 in September, um, some key insights came there with the engagement um, with the taxi industry. However, I, I do think that there still seems to be quite a big um, disconnect between um, the conversation that was being held um, at the Lehutla um, uh, with um, the actual taxi industry. And when I talk about the actual taxi industry, I'm talking about the operators, the 132,000 operators who actually own these assets that they, 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 they operate on a daily basis um, to move um, commuters. Um, so what? Now that we've been through COVID, they've been uh, major revenue losses. Um, the Department of Transport has um, taken a keen interest finally in, 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 in um, creating a, a, a sustainable um, minibus taxi industry. What is, what, what is going to happen? We've seen the Lohutla, we are looking forward to, to, the, to the Indaba. Is this reality or fiction? If you go to the, to, to, to the grassroots of the taxi industry, they will tell you that it's fiction, right? Because the conversations are happening at a level that has absolutely no interest in um, the revenue losses or the revenue generation that is happening on a daily basis in the, in, in the taxi industry. Institutional voids that have been um, created by um, the disconnect between um, 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 the different spheres of government that communicate um, with the with the with the minibus taxi industry at national level. It's a completely different conversation. However, if you go to cities um, and um, if you go to, to 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 provinces, it's also a totally different um, conversation. And perhaps, like Wayne mentioned. Um, the, the plague of corruption then creeps in um, and further um, expands these um, institutional voids. Um, formalization, what do they mean by formalization? Um, I think the conversation again, like I said, um, is being held at um, a, 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 a political level of um, the minibus taxi industry and not necessarily with the operator um, in the in the in the in the minibus taxi industry, which would then lead to the to the structure of of um, the minibus taxi industry, um, as well as um, integration um, to public transport networks. Who are we integrating? Are we integrating a political structure or are we integrating a, a private um, transport service? provider or a legal entity that would be able to, to, to contract um, with cities or, 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 or with government. So there are many challenges um, in, in, in uh, passenger transport and these are not just limited to 
to the minibus taxi industry. And um, I think COVID has actually amplified and, and highlighted um, some of these issues for issue for 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 um, um, instance um, when when we are going to um, go to um, how land is 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 used and the coordinated planning and um, the route mapping and the integration of 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 transport networks when um, cities are, 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 are planning um, for, 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 for development. Um, for instance, low cost housing is still placed in the city's peripheries and it results in long um, travel time and insufficient use of public transport, which is an apartheid um, legacy. Um, and this is how the minibus taxi industry has actually found um, it, 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 it's 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 growth patterns um, because um, when um, these developments are planned, um, there is no integration um, with whatever transport um, network planning or route planning um, takes place. So, for instance, you would find that. Um, uh, the, 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 the intermodal transfer is challenging due to the lack of, of integrated route planning, scheduling, ticketing, and the fact that um, new developments are always happening in the periphery with no thought to um, economic um, hubs being built around these um, 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 development. Um, again, heavy investment is needed to replace an aging rail infrastructure. We are not going to see that happening anytime soon. And as I mentioned um, before, the commuter is moving from rail um, to taxi. Um, and um, unless um, someone waves a magic wand and um, Prasa, I think um, next week, next next month, um, in, during October month, we, we are then going to hear what Prasa has, has planned in their turnaround strategy. But it would definitely be interesting to see um, whether Prasa has even um, paid attention or thought of, of um, the role the minibus taxi mm -hmm. industry could actually um, play in ensuring that um, Prasa um, goes back to being um, the backbone of, 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 of public transport. Lockdown recovery drivers for the taxi industry, um, geographic specialization. We saw that um, there was a, um, a, 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 a drop in um, obviously um, inter-provincial travel um, and there was a, a, a growth in the number of, of, of vehicles that were available um, in, 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 in specific regions. And then those vehicles started um, finding other uses. Um, increased um, efficiency. We saw the planning and the coordination that was taking place in, in the rank spaces um, become even more sophisticated without technology. So it would be interested to see um, with the introduction of, of technologies what that um, would happen. The scale and scope of, of the taxi industry again um, is, 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 is being um, clearly um, considered. And I think now um, cities are starting to have the conversation um, with, with the minibus taxi industry with regards to um, formulating those development plans that um, integrate um, public transport and the movement of people um, uh, 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 going forward. Um, <laughs> as the industry formalizes, um, there is obviously a case to subsidize the minibus taxi industry. And um, we have seen this um, in the media um, and it's been um, covered greatly. Um, I think the question and the discussion that is, that is happening now is, is whether that minibus taxi industry in its current form would be able to, to, to qualify for a subsidy of some sort from, um, from government. Um, um, however, what we do know for sure is that um, the subsidy for the, 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 the minibus um, taxi commuter is, is 
um, National Treasury as well as um, the National Department of Transport has has has, has um, paid um, a lot of, of of consideration to, and in the coming few months we are going to start seeing um, some um, suggestions with regards to um, what is going to happen with the with the with the with the commuter um subsidy um i think also what what um the opportunity that 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 has presented itself um to government um from the challenge of 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 um covid um, 19 is a strong focus on finally formalizing the minibus taxi industry um I, I do think um, that um, it's still early days to 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 say or 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 or, or to proclaim that it it will be successful. The taxi industry has a long history of of these type of engagements with different types of ministers. However, what we do know that is that the taxi industry remains um, the biggest public transport um, service provider in the country. And unless there are drastic measures um, that, that um, the Department of Transport as well as the industry in collaboration um, with cities, um, there is continuously going to be this disconnect and friction between um, government and um, the taxi industry. So thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, excellent presentation. And it's quite concerning what you're talking about, uh, you know, the discussions and negotiations on, long, on, 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 the, on the wrong level. and. Uh, you know, the space is leaving open now again for corruption and so on. So that is quite concerning. Uh, thank you very much. Um, we will definitely, well, the audience will definitely enjoy talking to you in the panel discussion just now. Um, I would like to, to introduce the audience to our next uh, uh, panelist. And that is uh, Mr. Andrew Barker. He's a development consultant. I just want to tell you a little bit more about Andrew quickly. He's a professional registered town and regional planner, urban strategist, environmental uh, protagonist, and stakeholder catalyzer. Um, uh, facilitated, facilitating stakeholder engagement and participation and thinking processes and decision making. He's worked in strategic urban planning and development processes in Johannesburg since 1983. This is largely involved the rehabilitation of mine impacted areas for urban development to bring about economic and social development. He's the founder and chairman of the Clip Refuse Back Sustainability Association, which was established to protect, promote, and enhance the value of natural assets in the south of Johannesburg. Has been involved in promoting the engagement of stakeholders in the development processes and facilitating the engagement and finding appropriate solutions for the issues they face. He's also a part-time voiceover artist. Andrew, man of many, many abilities and skills. Thank you very much. Um, we're looking forward. Andrew is going to talk to us about property infrastructure, a suggested approach to help address the economic recession from the roots. Thank you very much, Andrew.
And Ruby, we can't hear you. Can you perhaps mute and unmute again? I don't know what's going on. Try another mic. How's that? That's working fine. Thank you, Andrew. Okay, great. Um, yeah, if I could just go back to the beginning and say thank you for for all your organization with the forum um, and to Ubunya Capital for, for sponsoring uh, these sessions, which I think are invaluable opportunities to share information and, and share ideas. And I think we've had some fantastic inputs uh, through today already. Um, economic recession, are we approaching it correctly? And maybe the, the question should be something along the lines of, um, uh, I'm not getting an advance here. What is happening? Sorry. I'm not getting a slight advance here. Um, are, are we actually approaching it at all? Um, and I think you know we, we need to look at um, where we are at the moment, uh, what we need uh, to, to actually get an approach going, and what do we have to, to put an approach that, that could work together? Um, and then put a, a couple of suggestions and, and possible initiatives that, that we could look at. And I thought it was rather appropriate this morning in the Daily Maverick, uh, which came through, um, new definition for status quo provided by Ronald Reagan. Um, it's the mess we're in. And I think the, the common thinking now, do we return to status quo? We certainly don't want to return to the mess we're in. Um, I think Mike and, and Wayne gave us a, an incredible insight as to how our economic situation is at the moment and uh, the impact that COVID has had and uh, how, how, how some of the situations that we're dealing with, are, are we going to get out of it? Um, the state is in a state. Uh, Wayne gave us a very good insight there as to the problems we're facing. And uh, we obviously need to, to look at, at the, the various policies and strategies that exist, and there are plenty of them, but we're not delivering and uh, the state hasn't delivered. Uh, we've, got, we've got issues around the, the ability of, of people in the state to deliver. And we can see it from the way its political appointees have arrived and the state trying to do it to so go, go, go and do things alone uh, with a lack of partnership with, with the private sector. Uh, and of course, there's the, the corruption and the problems there. And then compliance enforcement. We have some very good laws, but they're not enforced. And a lot of problems are arising out of that. Um, uh, we have a very optimistic president who, who says that we, we will use this moment of crisis to build a new economy and unleash South Africa's true potential. Yes, and I totally agree with what Mike and Wayne said earlier on. We have fantastic potential and we do need to unleash it. But as our Reserve Bank governor said, um, we haven't implemented any of the major plans from the past. <laughs> And perhaps we need to, to look at doing things differently. Plans are there, strategies are there, the policies are there. Uh, there may be too much regulation and laws, uh, and we certainly need to look at that. The private sector wants to get on with it. We want to find solutions. We want to do business. We want to make money. We want to serve our clients. But what's been interesting is with COVID is that the corporate sector is also recognizing the importance of addressing social needs. And, and trying to work together with communities uh, to address those needs uh, and through that start to create employment to support small business and to start looking at water and energy security. Uh, there's, there's a lot of realization that sustainability and environment have to become part of our focus these days. And you know, there's, there's a huge uh, complex issues that we are dealing with. Um, there are many elements, there's many interplays and, and dependencies. And, and really each of us is trying to grapple with these in our own ways, uh, trying to rationalize, to realize, respond and rejuvenate in some way. 
And unfortunately, and the stories are many and they're very hard, many of us are just trying to survive at the moment. And I think it's where I want to start looking at the, the approach that we need to take, and that is looking at the reality on the ground. Um, back in, in 2019, the Financial Mail put out a, a, a publication or published on a, the, the expectation of food insecurity in South Africa in March 2020, 137 people um, being affected by food security issues. Um, the people are hungry and COVID has made it worse. And that was 2019. In 2017, the City of Joburg Food Security Survey established that approximately one in five respondent households were severely food insecure. Now, what's COVID done to that? What has the economic situation done to that? And I think it's probably a much higher proportion now. And going back to Vusi's point about peripheral development, our highest de deprivation levels are out in the peripheries of, of the city. So down in the deep south of Johannesburg, those are where they are seeing their highest deprivation, furthest from where jobs are. And how do we bring economic development into those areas and what infrastructure have we got and what are some of the, the things we need to do to actually address food security, unemployment and the poverty that we're seeing as a result of not only the economic decline, but also the impacts of COVID. Um, in, in 2014, the Gauteng City Region put together a uh, a, a vignette on, on food security. And one starts to look at some of the figures in there where we're eating over 5 million tons of food, but we're only producing about 61,000 tons a year. So there's a huge opportunity here to start looking at food and the agricultural value chain as a way of addressing unemployment, uh, food security, uh, to address poverty by actually stimulating that, that agricultural value chain. In addition, 70% of the households of Joburg source food from informal markets. So why aren't we looking at those informal markets and saying, why don't we jack them up and get them more formalized in inverted commas to actually address that, those needs and start to develop economic opportunities around that. And 33.6 of the households in Gauteng produce their own food. So there's an opportunity there for people to start their own home gardens and start to see opportunities from the produce that they're producing in excess. And so from that point of view, my feeling is we really need to get back to the roots. And our, our main focus and the main aim of where we, we should be looking at is to realize sustainable livelihoods. Um, we need to get to the point where we are seeing that People are, sorry, I don't know what's happened here. Um, people are, 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 are filling their tummies, igniting the food chain and stimulating small business growth. And that will start to lead us to sustainable livelihoods. And the impact of that will be to create employment, change our mindsets and behaviors. So I'm seeing the agricultural value chain and getting back to the roots, getting back to growing our own food, starting to address a lot of the ills that we need to rebuild our economy and bring us out of where we are now. And if we look in the transport industry, we have a number of ingredients which we can use for that solution. So if we look at the different modes, the, the road, the rail, the buses, the taxis, that is an amazing network of transport systems which we have already established. We have a number of ranks and stops. We have stations. We have logistics facilities uh, along major routes. And we have urban management areas as nodes within the urban areas that look after the growth and development of some of our urban infrastructure. We have a smart technology and the growth of that, which is incredibly good opportunity for us to start looking at how we regrow and redevelop our economy around food. And then we have this amazing opportunity of downtime within particularly our mini bus taxi industry. 
Their peaks are hectic, but they have a downtime. And there's a resource there in terms of humankind to actually try and do something and make, and make improvements. And as Rizzi has shared with us recently, and I haven't got her latest figure, she rolled those off to today, 70% of our South African population rely on public transport, of which 68% use the minibus. So that's an amazing football that's starting to go through this network of, of, of transport, through these various stops, through these nodes, and we start to say, here we have the opportunity. So let's take a taxi rank, for example. And remember, we can put these out in the periphery. We can start to look at areas of open space, uh, old dumping grounds near taxi ranks, which are at the moment full of litter, clean them up, turn them into vegetable gardens, start to use them for, for, for opening up the, the opportunities around agriculture, using the downtime to look at providing opportunities for, for those people to get involved in, in a second job, uh, in a secondary industry, and looking at providing supplies, to look at the gardening, but also to look at skills development and even business skills. And I'll come with some solutions on that just now as well. And then from an agricultural point, there is a whole heap of different opportunities that one can look at in terms of the different types of agricultural uh, methods we can, we can use. And in urban areas, you start to look in the center of town. Uh, we can look at rooftops. We can look at indoor farming, uh, vertical and horizontal. You can start to look at hydroponics and aquaponics. And even now within containers, the, the idea of aeroponics. And then we mustn't forget the protein side of livestock and fish. So all of these uh, different opportunities and value chains that we can start to bring to bear within this, this, this uh, network of infrastructure that we have. And then obviously there's the harvesting and the marketing, which will, will follow from that. And we start to look at formalizing the small traders and the different aspects of the value value chain that starts to deliver the food products and start to look at the food preparation, agro-processing and agro-businesses that we can start to develop within that industry and along that value chain. And then of course the logistics. And that's what transport's all about, different types of transport, uh, looking at deliveries, uh, looking at the taxis themselves, bicycles, motorbikes, and even the mini and micro motorized, the electric bikes and things like that, which are starting to come out and starting to be more popular. So there's, there's a huge opportunity there and then overlay this with smart technology, the linkages that can happen between the growers and the users. We have an excellent app already in Kula, which is, which is providing that linkage between the grower and the producer and, and, and the user and, and Let's look at that smart technology and improve the use of it to bring all of these components together, to talk to each other, to make things efficient and effective. If we look at the logistics um, uh, freight industry as well, if we look at the N3 from, from City Deep in Johannesburg down to Durban, we have various stops along there. And one particular stop, which we're looking at at the moment, is in Cato Ridge, where they're looking at a, at a new logistics hub at, at Cato Ridge, which is located in the middle of a rural area. So not only can we use this agricultural value chain to stimulate the economy in urban areas, but why don't we also look at it within the rural areas, where we can start to get the villages and the homes involved in growing to get the supplies and skills development and business skills and start to improve the opportunities for those, those people within the rural areas to become small entrepreneurs, to look at the different types of gardening and, and agricultural production, to look at livestock and fish systems. And we can look at the freight logistics as part of that distribution as well. The communities and the villages look at the harvesting, the marketing, Again, the formalization of traders around these, these uh, freight hubs with the food preparation, agro-processes and agribusinesses, and then the, the whole question of logistics and deliveries and the smart technology overlying those linkages and getting everybody talking together. 
Now, this again is starting to look at these economic hubs within using the, the transport system and, and, and the various stops and, and freight logistics hubs that we can actually look at stimulating economic growth, addressing food security, and starting to get people um, more active within the economy. Now, one of the other projects that we're working on at the moment is in City Deep. Um, IPROP own huge areas of land in there, which we're developing. And one of the particular projects we're looking at is an agricultural hub um, around City Deep Foreshaft, next to the Joburg Fresh uh, Produce Market, based on a green economy thinking. And the idea is that this will be used to look at all aspects of growing business. So we start with, with a, a broad-based enterprise development where from, from the homes, you start to produce an excess, you start to measure, you start to realize there's profit, and you start to do more business. And you start to look at, oh, I can do this. So we then look at how we do enterprise development and working with, with uh, UJ and, and their various programs and their technology and research development uh, units we start to look at how we improve this, this whole enterprise development around, around the agricultural value chain. And then we start to look at basic livestock management, and we also start to look at food production. Now, all of these components are being put into this agricultural hub with a view to looking and recognizing that the other nodes through Joburg, through the freight uh, logistics chain down to, to um, to Durban can all become part of the satellite network, which starts to look at the agricultural hub as an important focal point in terms of the development of this agricultural value chain to address the food security issues on a sustainable basis. We can't do handouts anymore. We've got to teach the people to fish. So we don't keep on having to hand out the fish. So from that point of view, I think it's of critical importance that we look at a whole new way of our economy at its depth to, 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 to address those problems we have on the ground. There are macro issues. I don't deny that. And I think Mike and Wayne have, have, have outlined those incredibly well. But the bottom line is, at the moment, the people are hungry. The, the job losses, the economic impacts have been huge. People have, have lost their jobs and they are turning to crime, unfortunately, to, to, to address their basic needs. And we need to address those basic food needs before we can start to see that behavior change. So we do this by going where the masses are and we start to look at where the, the people are and using the existing network of transport and infrastructure to rebuild that economy, again, where the people are. We use the various modes and nodes and routes and start to make those not only for moving people, for moving goods and using it for, for trading and, and stimulating that, those economic nodes throughout the network. Feed them and then trigger that food value chain. That food value chain, many countries and nations have been built from the farmers up. And we need to go back to those basics and start to, to re-trigger re that value chain and the economic opportunities throughout it. It's time for action. We've had enough talk and we've got to get on with it. And we cannot sit and wait for the state. And we have to, as communities, as private sector, if it's moral, if it's legal, if it's logical and fits the various strategies, plans and policies, we must do it, prove it, and share it. Thanks very much. Yeah, Andrew, thank you very much for this uh, great presentation and what a great value chain you're supposing or proposing. I think this should have happened a long time ago. Thank you so much. I see there's already nice comments in the chat box about this. So uh, yeah, I'm sure the audience is going to engage with you nicely now in the, in the panel discussion. Um, <coughs> We can have Vuji also unmuting herself. I don't know if Wayne and, and Mike Schussler are still, if they're still on the call, they also welcome to unmute and join the discussion. Um, so let's give uh, the, the, 
the, the journalists the opportunity first to ask questions. Um, they welcome to unmute and ask the question. Okay, it seems to me the journalists are happy this far. Um, anybody else who want to unmute and ask question? Uh, can I quickly ask a question? Please, Mike. <laughs> I found it very interesting, uh, the last two presentations. I think it's very interesting um, because the taxi industry is actually the first uh, real industry that uh, came from the African uh, part of South Africa. And it's very good uh, to see this sort of um, working. And I really think Andrew has a point in terms of the um, agriculture part of it. I'm not always sure <clears throat> what the costs are going to be. And I think that's, you know, it's still hanging up in the air, but it's a, it was fantastic and it was interesting. I think uh, I would like to ask this question uh, to our host today. If, if we are looking at the taxi industry, does the taxi industry have the capacity, if we get back to, say, full steam by mid next year, to take over the role of, say, a prasa? Because, you know, that's quite a lot of extra traffic. Um, and uh, also, how do we get, because the people that use those trains pay less um, than on a taxi, as you're probably aware. And, uh, you know, that's the poorer element. And I wonder if there's not a way that we could combine, I don't know, buses and, uh, and mini buses or something, because I really am worried about uh, the people at the lower end in our country's working environment, because I really don't know if we have enough um, capacity and if they have enough money then to get to work. Um, uh, it's just a couple of comments, I guess, but my question is, do we have enough capacity? And is there any ideas how we can make the prices a little bit cheaper on, say, certain routes or do something to those routes? Um, I'm a bit concerned about the whole process story anyway. That's me. Done. Thank you, Mike. Buji? Um, I think I think um, thank you for the question, um, Mike. And I think that is something we 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 have been considering at length. And I think um, Jack van der Merwe would also attest to the fact that this is something that um, has been thought of. And um, in actual fact, what has happened is that um, we have seen the move of commuters from the the the, the, the train to the minibus without even. Um, the trigger of of of, um, of 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 COVID. Now the challenge is um, the subsidy um, in in South Africa um, was incredibly distorted by the Department of Transport. Now the Department of Transport does not have a subsidy policy. That is why you find a how train commuter who can afford to use the how train being subsidized and the minibus taxi commuter who cannot afford to, 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 to use the minibus not being subsidized. So that's the beginning stage of, of, of the conversation. If we are absorbing a lot of commuters from the trains, why are those commuters not moving with their subsidy? Why is the commuter subsidy not um, um, a mode agnostic? Um, you can use your, 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 your public transport subsidy on any mode of your choice. So that's definitely one of the conversations that we are having um, with the Department of Transport. So it's not to say subsidize the minibus taxi industry um, assets to begin with. Can we subsidize the commuter? Because we already know that with the declining household incomes, people are moving to cheaper modes of transport. Now, if rail is not available or rail is ailing, people are going to be paying more in the taxi anyway. Therefore, they should be able to use their subsidy in the minibus taxi. In comes the challenge. Government does not know who the minibus taxi industry is. Um, if you go to cities, they will tell you there are 
40,000 taxis operating in, in the Gauteng province. You go to the provincial level, they will tell you it's 120,000 um, minibus taxi vehicles operating in, 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 the, in, the, in, in, in the province. So there's also a data disconnect. Nobody knows who this taxi industry is. Um, the, the national household, the new national household travel survey that's going to come out now um, is going to give us a bit more insight as to who the minibus taxi um, commuter is, but the minibus taxi also does not have a way of tracking who that commuter is, therefore they cannot access um, a subsidy. Capacity, I think the taxi industry has um, really honed on the agility model. Um, if there's a development here today, tomorrow there will be taxis operating from that development to wherever. So um, the, 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 the capitalization as well as the reach of the minibus taxi industry is not a problem. It's the structure and the way in which we can move the commuters um, sustainably from other modes of transport into the minibus taxi industry. And we are by no way saying that we don't want rail. What we are saying is that public transport should be integrated in areas where the minibus taxi can be a feeder to a rail network, let it be so. In areas where the minibus taxi can be a feeder to the bus network, let it be so. But it should not be competing as it is right now. Yeah. lots of good um all right so there's one question uh from the, from the chat box there's a lot of comments so i encourage you guys to have a look at the, the comments in the in the chat box uh, angeline you want to ask a question thank you thank you very much thank you for the presentation with regard to the market share which you have just shared we see that mm. is there a breakdown i think i'm more concerned to understand the you know, the, the, this gap or how best to address inequality between rural as well as urban transport provision. Well, these were some kind of studies, but you know, it will take us a long time as we do this district municipality assessment and surveys. Um, I'm yes. asking this because one way of formalizing or entrenching that uh, the taxi operators in rural area become a part of this economic space or they sustain themselves um, is through scheduled services, mm -hmm. you know. And when you look at that, you know, it, it is a little bit shaky for them to sustain themselves looking at the morning and after evening peak. But the in between thing, you know, in terms of public transport is still is still not adequately addressed. And this, uh, we want to address this so that we ensure at least that the new players and also equitable. Uh, provision for mm -hmm. rural as well as urban transport services. Yeah. yeah. So so I think the biggest challenge um, to date is, is the structure of the minibus taxi industry. Because we do not um, have a, a, a formalized structure that you can contract or that you can um, um, engage with on a, on a, on a, on a, a cooperation level, it's always challenging because politics come in and um, uh, 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 the taxi industry mafia would step in and, and all of that. That is why when you go into, the, into, into specifically um, cities where there have been uh, um, initiatives, for instance, if you look at um, Eteguini with the Mojo Cruise um, 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 initiative, you also look at um, the, 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 the Nelson Mandela integrated uh, public transport um, um, system that they came up with. You look at the city of Joburg, um, simple, the negotiations for the BRT, they always end up being fragmented. Now, the idea is that you want to integrate the minibus taxi industry, but in its current form, it cannot be integrated. So the first point um, of, of engagement should always be ensuring that 
the, 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 the structure of the entity that you, you, you are engaging with is, is, the, is a structure that is going to be conducive to what you are trying to achieve as a city or as a, as a, as a municipality or even as a, as a as, as, as the national government. Right now, the, 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 the Lekhutla came back and with the suggestion of um, a single um, entity that is going to be representative of, of the taxi industry's interests. Now, here's the challenge. The taxi industry is made up of 132,000 individual business owners. These guys are the guys who fork out their money to buy assets so that they can operate and generate a profit. Now, what do you mean if you say I'm going to only engage with a formal entity in what context? Are you going to take into, the, into consideration my business? Um, what does this entity say? Does it say I need to forego my sole proprietorship so that I can, I can, I can operate as this um, big VOC that, 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 that is representative of the taxi industry. So while there are a lot of opportunities that exist in integrating um, taxi operators at a rural or urban level, the challenge will always be the same. If you don't solve for the structure of the taxi industry, is it formal, is it corporatized or whatever structure that you need um, to be able to engage with, you are always going to fail. Thank you, Vujay. Yes, sir. And from Olga Masilo, she's asking, do you think electric vehicles uh, will be introduced in the taxi industry? Electric vehicles. Okay. So we, we, we've had um, a, 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 this, 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 this conversation before. Now, if you're looking at um, um, where, where, where more um, advanced cities, uh, are going um, with regards of, 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 of mobility and um, public transportation and um, green transport, um, it's feasible. But if you are looking at the South African context where we are still dealing with um, issues of, 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 of um, uh, uh, special inequality, where we are still dealing with a fragmented uh, public transport network that is, is not sustainable. Um, the conversation of electronic vehicles should be something that is, is, is um, considered in, in the system. So you cannot just look at it and say, we need to introduce electronic vehicles in Soweto. Now, if you're looking at um, the structure of Soweto and the needs of the people in Soweto, the needs of the op public transport operators in, in, in Soweto, we are still quite a bit far from um, electronic vehicles. I mean, the infrastructure alone, our cities are struggling with having um, dedicated bus stops or taxi stops, right? Now, the expectation that our cities are going to be able to build um, electronic vehicle um, infrastructure that is going to sustain um, public transport vehicles such as the taxi industry, it's, it's, um, it's, it's still pie in the sky right now. And you have to be quite realistic as much as we'd want to be that advanced, move to autonomous vehicles, move towards um, electronic vehicles as quickly as possible. The challenges right now are challenges of structure and infrastructure in, 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 in our public transport um, space. Thank you, Vujie. Mm -hmm. All right, let's 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 throw it up onto the audience again. Anybody want to ask a question? I, can I make a comment, Harry? Yes, Mike. And yes, Mike, please. Ask an indirect question in a way. What if Thank we you. put the power in the hands of the consumers? We do that for electricity. We give people a certain amount that they can use every month or water they get for free. Now that's fixed. But if we use newer technologies like Uber has, you could have an app or a card that measures and you would then get onto your favorite transport. You would pay, say one rand a kilometer on a taxi, pay 50 cents a kilometer on a bus and 20 cents a kilometer on a train then you, the consumer, decide and you pay over because uh, this thing will be uh, geographically, they'll know where you are on the smartphone, but there are cards that I guess we could do. 
And then to bring in Andrew and other things that creates jobs is that you could work. If you haven't got to work, but you work at a taxi rank and you plant veggies or whatever, there's some sort of reward that goes to that card so that you can go somewhere else for a job interview or whatever the case may be. Um, my comments would be uh, in a different way is I don't think it's about equality always, especially when you get to an industry. It's about efficiency. Mm -hmm. And it's about getting people to work so that they can rise up uh, and get their own income and their own wealth and their own stability. So that to me is just a comment because I think we'd like to see um, the, the, a way forward for the consumer to make a lot of choices. That way, anyway, we take out all the mafias and stuff, because I also understand, I don't know everything about it, but there definitely is a lot of people that talk about this. So what Ruby Sealy says is quite right in what I've heard. And But I think with this sort of technology, you can bring in the Andrews and uh, the property the developments as well in that sense. And you will anyway find out how consumers move for the Department mm -hmm. of Planning, the, uh, the, uh, transport for planning purposes, because you will get an integrated, uh, not a count, but a movement uh, thing. I've seen, uh, as you have seen on the, the truck side, um, what those guys, what they called in Peter Maritzburg again, Harry, uh, God, I forgot. Um, uh, quick my and, and, and you could do the same sort of stuff. So the Department of Transport benefits, the local authorities benefit, they get that data where people go. They can do their planning on where they want to build new roads, where they want to do things right through, and it's available to the taxi operators. So it remains a competitive industry, and it's available to people who want to plan a cafe or whatever. That's all. Ah, too much. Sorry. Thank you, Mike. Let's let's give so, Nomonde, um, uh, Nomendo, Nomonde Mompuro wants to ask a question. Let's opportunity. Thank you, Harry. Good morning to everyone. Thank you for the fruitful um, presentation. My question is directed to Vuisile with regards to transport. There are areas whereby the taxis, neither the taxis or buses, comes in near the people. Is it possible that when you negotiate or trying to formalize the, the transport sector, you make the buses or a taxi be accessible to where people stay? For instance, the how train buses, I stay in Birch Acres. We don't have the buses there. We need to take a taxi or two taxis to Roadsfield Station and say, my applies when we come back. There's no taxis that is direct us to there and back home. So is it possible that to open up and the taxi or the bus or the transport system be accessible for the people? Thank you. Thank you, Nomonde. Buji, you and colleagues can respond now to Mike's comments and Nomonde. Um, I think um, just in, in response to, 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 to Nomonde, um, I think this, this is definitely the conversation that um, cities and, and development planners such as um, Andrew and, and um, us in public transport should be having in collaboration because they should not be areas where public transport is inaccessible because that again speaks to the disconnect between developments um, that, happened, that happened in cities and transport um, planning that happens in cities that is disconnected. Now, um, we understand that you cannot have trunk routes where buses and trains are available in, 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 in all regions, but they should always be feeder systems, which can either be the, the taxi industry or even the meter taxi industry that feed into, into, in, 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 into those um, trunk routes with the how train or, 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 or with buses. So again, this is a challenge to us and, 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 and cities and um, development planners that the consideration should always be about the transportation and the movement of people in those development. And um, then just also speaking um, to, to what Mike was saying, I'm in full agreement. I mean, um, if you just solve for the efficiency 
of the minibus taxi industry. And you, 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 you model the, the, the formalization of the taxi industry in such a way that the cost of operating the taxi is reduced. You introduce a, a commuter subsidy um, you, you, you reduce the cost of, of, of public transport for the commuters, the country's savings or the money that is available inside household to spend increases. I mean, that's a no-brainer. It, at its most basic, um, that would be the multiplier effect that happens by solving um, for, the, for, 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 the, for, for, for the taxi industry's efficiency. Harry, if I can come in there, I think I think Thank it's you. been one of the the long term debates, chicken and egg debates, transport or land use, um, and it's always one of those which goes into sort of long philosophical theoretical stories. But the bottom line is we have people in places and they need to move, or we need the places to move. And this goes back to a comment that Rick made earlier and I've made before. We've got to bring jobs to where the people are. Mm. And if we can use, as we're suggesting, the agricultural value chain as an opportunity to start stimulating those jobs as economic nodes around taxi ranks, around stops, around stations, we can start to look at those economic nodes developing and adding value to the people's journeys. Um, instead of buying in the middle of town and taking all your stuff out back to Soweto, let's start creating those nodes and start to create those opportunities around where the people are. And the people are there. We know the people are there. We see them in the buses and we see them in queues. And we need to look at how we use the taxi rank, not just as a taxi rank. We've got to bring multi-purpose use into those, those little nodes and start to develop it, not as big shopping centers and malls and things like that, but to regularize it in some way that the people feel comfortable using that as their source of shopping. Um, and, and we can really look at changing what public transport is about by bringing in these multiple opportunities and economic growth. And yes, the town planners and the transport guys have got to start talking together. But we've got to start looking at our regulations. We've got to start at look at making sure that we can make this flexibility around these transport nodes and start thinking of, stop thinking of just a single use and look at multiple use and bring those jobs closer to where the people are living. And the transport network is such a powerful network that we can try and build on that and start to look at the opportunities there. Absolutely. Thank you, Andrew. Guys, we're running out of time now, so let's give the last opportunity for questions. Anybody else who want to ask a question? I think too many people are happy and they want to go and have lunch now. Um, let's give our panelists an opportunity for some closing remarks. Uh, maybe, Andrew, if we can start with you. Harry, thank you. I think, I think today has been a fascinating session. Uh, there is depression and there are problems, but I'm seeing a lot of hope and opportunity. And uh, yes, if we, if we work together and if we allow the private sector, the community and the informal sector to start looking at how we can help each other and, and, and be cooperative and collaborative, I really think we can start from the lower levels of, of, of being uh, at the ground level, addressing firstly, the basic need of feeding people. But with that, once they've got food in their tummies, their brains start to work and we can start to actually do something very positive and very exciting. We have seen it working in, in some of the work that we're doing and I believe the opportunity is there to take it a lot wider. But thanks very much for today, it's been fantastic. Thank you to you, Andrew. Um, Mark Shishley, you want to say a few words though? I think Mark has left. Um, let, let's give the last word to our host, Vuji Sile Majola. Um, thanks again, everybody. Um, I think um, today was definitely a kickstarter to what we're going to see in um, Transport Month. Um, I, am, I am really looking forward to our next engagement um, 
including um, the event that will be on the 1st of, of, of October that is going to be um, um, lead hosted by um, the, the University of, of um, Johannesburg, who will be part of of that um, event. Um, we are looking forward to really setting um, the tone for the review of, of the transport white paper as, as well as um, creating those round table um, discussions with regards to, to, to public transport and the immediate um, small changes that um, we can start making. And um, I really look forward to our next event. Again, thank you very much for, for, for joining us and the questions and the insights. Um, our website is a, a, and email address is available on the transport forum. Um, should you require any other um, insights or clarification with just some of the things that we, 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 we shared here today. Our passion is public transport, specifically the, 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 the taxi industry. And this platform starting from um, um, March this year, we have really, really gained a lot of momentum with regards to creating um, a, a platform for those um, engagements with all stakeholders that take particular interest in the taxi industry, as well as public transport in general. Thank you very much uh, for joining us, everybody. We look forward to seeing you on the, on the 1st of October, as well as all other engagements that will be happening um, during Transport Month. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vuji. Thank you for being our host today. We indeed looking forward to 1st of October. It's all about driving the necessity for change in public yeah. transport of Africa. When yeah. we published the event in the first half an hour, we had more than 100 people who booked already for the event. Yes, yes. We're going to have uh, great sessions in the morning. It's month of transport and the mm -hmm. afternoon we're going to have breakout, virtual breakouts. And Uji is one of the chairs for one of the breakout sessions. Thank you for that as well. So we're really looking forward to that. And once again, thank you to all our panelists. We really appreciate your time and your knowledge with us. We're looking forward to see you again. So guys, take care and uh, be healthy. Stay well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Harry. Thanks, Harry and Luis.